objection, the chair is authorized to declare a recess of the committee at any time. Before we begin today's hearing, I want to remind members of a few matters, including some required uh, by the regulations accompanying House Resolution 965, uh, which established the framework for remote uh, committee seatings. First, members are reminded to keep their video uh, function uh, on at all times, even when they're not recognized by the chair. Members are also reminded that they're responsible for muting and unmuting themselves and to mute themselves after they have finished speaking. The staff have been instructed uh, not to mute members except when a member is not being recognized and there is inadvertent background noise. Members are further reminded that they may only attend one, one uh, remote hearing at a time. So if you are participating today, please remain with us during the hearing. Members should try to avoid coming in and out of the hearing, particularly during the question period. If during the hearing, members wish to be recognized, the chair recommends that members identify themselves by name so as to facilitate the chair's recognition. I would also ask that members be patient as the chair proceeds, given the nature of the online platform the committee is using. Finally, members are reminded that all house rules relating to order and decorum apply to this remote hearing. This hearing is entitled Oversight of Prudential Regulators, Ensuring the Safety, Soundness, Diversity, and Accountability of Depository Institutions During the Pandemic. I will now recognize myself for four minutes to give an opening statement. On November 3rd, America decisively rejected President Trump, his harmful policies, and his dangerous rhetoric. The American people have given President-elect Biden a mandate to govern and reverse the harmful policies of the Trump administration, including the many actions that several of our witnesses have taken to deregulate Wall Street. This mandate is entirely consistent with recent state referenda in which voters in red states embrace progressive economic policies. For example, in Nebraska, voters banned usury, approving a statewide interest rate cap of 36%. In Florida, voters approved a $15 an hour minimum wage. It is clear that Americans want a financial and economic system that works for them and not against them. I was inspired by the words of President-elect Biden on how he wants to unify the country. As ever, I stand ready to work with members on both sides of the aisle and the incoming Biden administration on reforming our financial system so that consumers and investors have the protections they need. President-elect Biden uh, has already begun the work of building a better future for our nation. On Monday, we established the Coronavirus Task Force showing how seriously he is working this virus. Make no mistake, the pandemic continues to take a terrible toll. There have been over 10.2 million US cases and over 239,000 people have lost their lives to the virus. We are now seeing over 100,000 new US cases a day for the first time. From the beginning of this pandemic, I have urged regulators to focus their efforts on pandemic response and halt rulemakings unrelated to addressing the crisis. I'm very concerned that regulators have nonetheless issued numerous harmful deregulatory rules in the midst of the ongoing pandemic. For example, the OCC issued a harmful rule that badly undermines the Community Reinvestment Act. Regulators have also moved to weaken the vocal rule, which prevents banks from gambling the taxpayer money. There have also been a number of troubling rulemakings uh, to weaken capital and other prudential requirements for the nation's largest banks. The last thing the nation needs during this crisis 
or actions from regulators that harm com communities and make our financial system riskier and less stable. I'm putting our witnesses on notice that I will be working with the Biden administration to roll back these rules. Financial regulation and the approach to diversity and inclusion in this country are going to change uh, for the better. With the historic election of this country's first woman and person of color to serve as vice president, it is already changing for the better. Under my leadership, the committee has led the way on diversity and inclusion, establishing a historic subcommittee on diversity and inclusion, aptly chaired by Representative Beatty. Under President Biden's leadership, our financial regulators will and must be diverse. We are merging from the dark days of the Trump administration into the dawn of a new progressive America, where pro-consumer and pro-investor policies will always be first on the agenda. The chair now recognizes the ranking member of the committee, the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. McHenry, for four minutes mm -hmm. for an opening statement. Well, thanks so much. I want to thank the regulators for being here. Uh, I would also uh, note for the chair that I don't see the election outcome as this vote for the woke left uh, policy agenda of uh, House progressives, anything but that. We have new, more Republicans in the next Congress in the House of Representatives because, quite frankly, the far left went so far. And so while you have a, a you may um, you may have uh, have had some successes in the election. Uh, I don't think it's a wide endorsement of a far left policy agenda that the chair noted. In fact, what I would note is in the middle of this pandemic, instead of taking political pot shots, we should be taking serious, uh, have a serious concerted effort to have a serious conversation in this committee like we have not had in the midst of this pandemic. Um, and I think that is a very, very sad thing that we've not been more focused on financial stability and the important work that these regulators that are before us today uh, have been about this year. So with that, I'd like to thank uh, our witnesses for being here today, and I want to commend them for the work that they have put in to address the effects of the pandemic on our financial system. Uh, they've done a fantastic job, a wonderful, fantastic job, and they all should be commended for the work that they've put in uh, to act decisively at the start of this crisis to provide the necessary certainty and clarity uh, for our financial system. Uh, your quick implementation of the uh, provisions of the CARES Act from March forward provided a fi financial institutions and consumers appropriate flexibility to accommodate their daily challenges uh, that, that they faced in the midst of this pandemic. I would also encourage you um, to continue examining the regulations in your purview to ensure stability in the banking system. As I've said previously, and we'll repeat again today, our focus must be on the following, increasing testing, opening schools safely, and getting people back to work. Last week, unemployment dropped to just under 7%, a rapid turnaround from the April high of 14.7%. This is a good start. Our economy is rebounding. But more can be done. And I believe pro growth regulations and policies are the key to sustained success. We know that modernizing and right sizing regulations will unleash the economy and allow consumers and small businesses to flourish. And that's what you're doing. And I appreciate that work that you're about. A big part of that is regulatory clarity. I want to thank Acting uh, Comptroller uh, Brooks and um, Chair McWilliams for their work to help bring certainty to the legal status of loans made through banking partnerships. Much of the innovation in financial services right now is happening within the context of partnerships between banks and fintech firms. Your efforts have uh, helped bring greater definition to the regulatory and supervisory models for these partnerships. We should also continue to examine the importance of de novo charters in rural banking. Serving banking deserts uh, is a necessary aspect of supporting our Main Street and rural small businesses. And I want to commend my colleague from Kentucky, Congressman Barr, for his work on this important issue. Now, more than ever, technology is going to play an essential role in our financial future. Innovation is, an important, is important for our success. As new policies are considered, we should ensure that government is not standing in the way of private sector creativity and helping our people. I'll end where I started. 
the tone of this hearing does not bode well for the next Congress. We have the ability to find bipartisan, good bipartisan solutions that all promote a successful financial system that is inclusive and addresses the needs of the American people. Yet my colleagues continue to, to choose divisiveness over bipartisanship, and that is disappointing. I want to thank all the witnesses for being here today and for your um, for your solid good work in the midst of this uh, pandemic, health pandemic. Thanks so much. The chair now recognizes the chair of the subcommittee on consumer protection and financial institutions. Mr. Meeks for one minute. Thank you, Madam Chair. As we reach the end of the 116th Congress, it is important to consider all the accomplishments of this committee, for which I congratulate our chairwoman and all the members of this committee. As chair of the Consumer Protection and Financial Institution Subcommittee, I set out to focus my work on issues of discrimination, inequality, and the unbanked and underbanked. I spent the bulk of my time working for on minority banks and community development financial institutions and thinking that a period of relative stability and a decade into the expansion that started under President Obama's leadership was a perfect opportunity to tackle these issues. The COVID-19 pandemic and nationwide protests against police brutality and racial injustice have laid bare these structural inequalities and yes, discrimination across our system. I would argue that the agenda set in this committee for the 116th Congress was, was presented, processive and laid the foundation for the urgent priorities of our nation grappled with today. And it is an inflection point. And so therefore, I thank you, Madam Chair, again, for tackling these issues. And I look forward to continuing to work with you. Thank you. The chair now recognizes the subcommittee's ranking member, Mr. Lukemeyer, for one minute. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you to all the regulators that are here today for being, uh, being here in this critical time uh, for our nation's economy. As you know, the pandemic caused a blanket shutdown across the country and threatened tens of millions of American jobs. But the strength of American businesses and workers responded with an astounding 33% increase in the GDP in the third quarter. It's clear Americans have undergone a heroic effort to adapt to the strain and pressure of the pandemic. And with recent news of vaccine, economic recovery is in full swing. While this is good news, we must ensure that Congress and regulators do not hinder the progress the economy is making. To, to the contrary, regulators should enhance financial institutions' ability to aid in the economic recovery and ensure consumers and businesses can make it to the end of the pandemic. With many provisions in the CARES Act, including the TDR provision, set to expire at the end of the year, I'm very interested to hear what you, the prudential regulators, are going to allow institutions to do to keep their customers and the communities afloat in this, in this time. With that, I look forward to discussing the matters I yield back. Thanks. Thank you very much. I would now like to welcome today's distinguished panel. The Honorable Rodney Hood, who is Chairman of the National Credit Union Administration. The Honorable Joanna uh, Mac Williams, who is Chair of the Federal Depository Insurance Corporation. The Honorable Randall Quarles, who is Vice Chair of Supervision of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System. And Mr. Brian Brooks, who is the Acting Comptroller of the Currency at the Office of the Controller of the Currency. And so, without objection, all of your written statements will be made part of the record. Each of you will have five minutes to summarize your testimony. You should be able to see a timer on your screen that will indicate how much time you have left. And a time will go off at the end of your time. I would ask you to be mindful of the timer and quickly wrap up your testimony if you hear the chime so we can be respectful of both the witnesses and the committee members' time. Chairman Hood, you are now recognized for five minutes to present your oral testimony. Chair Roman Waters, Ranking Member McHenry, and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to provide an update on the safety, soundness, and diversity of federally insured credit unions and the NCRA's efforts to assist them during the ongoing COVID-19 emergency. Our nation's credit union system was well capitalized at the start of the pandemic and remains so today. With high levels of net worth and ample liquidity, this strength has allowed credit unions to adapt to the operational challenges resulting from the pandemic. 
Total assets in federally insured credit unions rose 15% over the year, ending in the second quarter of 2020 to $1.75 trillion. Credit union shares and deposits rose by nearly 17% to $1.49 trillion. Since mid-March, the NCUA has worked diligently to provide credit unions with regulatory relief and much needed flexibility so they can continue to safely serve their member owners. We've also adjusted our examination program to protect our staff, and we all continue to work remotely and effectively. We continue to examine for compliance with the Bank Secrecy Act and potential cybersecurity risk, helping to ensure our credit union system remains secure and resilient. We've issued 11 interagency statements and 20 guidance letters to the industry to date, helping credit unions to address emerging risk and implement the regulatory and statutory changes that have been made in response to the pandemic. The NCUA has provided over $3.7 million in technical assistance to small, low-income and minority credit unions in the form of our 2020 Community Development Revolving Loan Fund allocation, which went directly to COVID-19 assistance. The credit union systems net worth increased 6.8% over the year to $182.9 billion. The aggregate net worth ratio for the system stood at 10.46%, well above the 7% statutory requirement. The share insurance fund is also strong, and the equity ratio remains well within the statutory range under the Federal Credit Union Act. Accordingly, we believe there's no need to assess a premium at this time. Credit unions have continued to provide needed credit and financial services, with lending rising to an all-time high of $1.5 trillion in all major loan categories. Credit unions collectively extended $8.4 billion in loans under the SBA's Paycheck Protection Program, with an average loan amount of $49,000. Like capital, liquidity is a pillar of strength and the bedrock upon which the safety and soundness of the credit union system rests. Congress's decision to increase the flexibility of and borrowing authority for the Central Liquidity Facility in the CARES Act has contributed greatly to bolstering the availability of liquidity in the credit union system. Since the act was signed into law, the NCUA has successfully encouraged natural person and corporate credit unions to join the CLF. Today, the facility's borrowing capacity has exceeded $32 billion and provides access to nearly 80% of all credit unions. I'm indeed grateful that Congress provided this much needed authority in the CARES Act. However, I respectfully request that these changes be extended for the pandemic's duration so the credit union system and the NCUA can respond effectively should the need for emergency liquidity arise. One important lesson from 2020 is the need for greater financial inclusion. Lamentably, recent events have revealed many inequities in our society not the least of which is that the pandemic has had a more deleterious impact on communities of color. At the NCUA, we are proud of the fact that diversity, equity, and inclusion are part of who we are and how we do business. And Section 342 of Dodd-Frank has been a catalyst for growth and change. Indeed, we have made tremendous progress in this area over the last decade in terms of recruitment, employee retention, and procurement. Since becoming the 11th chairman of the NCUA, I have made financial inclusion a priority within the agency and the credit union system as a whole. I recently reinforced that commitment with the launch of a new financial inclusion initiative called ACCESS, advancing communities through credit, education, stability, and support. This initiative will refresh and modernize regulations, policies, and programs that all support greater financial inclusion within the agency and the credit union system and will address the specific needs of diverse communities. I look forward to working in partnership with the members of this committee towards this worthy endeavor. In closing, I'd like to thank the committee again for the opportunity to appear before you, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you. Am I supposed to go? Thank you, Chairman Hood. Chair Mac Williams, you are now recognized for five minutes to present your oral testimony. Thank you, Chairwoman Waters, Ranking Member McHenry, members of the committee and staff, and thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I hope that you and your families are staying healthy. 
When I appeared before you six months ago, we were confronting great uncertainty and volatility due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Many industries and segments of the economy were experiencing unprecedented declines in activity, and this shock was reverberating throughout the financial system. Although there remains considerable uncertainty about the path of the economy, the banking system has served as a source of strength throughout this period. Banks of all sizes have supported their customers and communities including by originating nearly $500 billion in PPP loans and accommodating more than $2 trillion in new deposits over two quarters. Today, I will provide an update on five areas in which the FDIC has made significant progress. Those areas are responding to economic risks related to COVID-19, enhancing our resolution readiness, supporting communities in need, prompting diversity and inclusion at the FDIC, and fostering technology solutions and encouraging innovation. My written statement provides a greater detail in each of these areas, but I would like to briefly touch on each of them, starting with how we responded to the economic risks related to the pandemic. Beginning in early March, the FDIC and our fellow regulators undertook a series of actions that helped maintain stability in financial markets. In addition to providing flexibility for banks to work with their borrowers, we made many targeted temporary regulatory changes to facilitate lending and other financial intermediation. We continue to monitor conditions and receive feedback from supervised institutions, and we will consider additional guidance as appropriate. As the FDIC responded to the immediate impact of the pandemic, we also focused on enhancing our resolution readiness in several ways. Although we entered the pandemic with a historically low number of bank failures, we recognize that the absence of failure could not last forever. Accordingly, the FDIC improved our resolution-related capabilities by, among other actions, centralizing our supervision and resolution activities for the largest banks, establishing a new approach to bank closing activities to help protect the health of our employees during the pandemic, and carrying out targeted engagement and capabilities testing with select firms on an as-needed basis. We are particularly mindful that minority and low and moderate income communities have suffered disproportionately during this pandemic. Shaped by my personal experiences and guided by a commitment to increasing financial inclusion in traditionally underserved communities, one of my priorities as FDIC chairman has been expanding our engagement and collaboration in support of minority depository institutions, so-called MDIs. One of the options we're exploring is a framework that would match MDIs and CDFIs with investors interested in the particular challenges and opportunities facing these institutions and their communities. We're in the process of creating a vehicle through which investors' funds would be channeled to make investments in or with MDIs and CDFIs. We're still developing the details, but expect to release more information in the near future. The FDIC is deeply committed to fostering a diverse workplace and inclusive work environment. Although we're not yet satisfied with our progress or the pace of change, we have taken meaningful steps in furtherance of this goal and we will not stop. The racial, ethnic, and gender diversity of the FDIC workforce continues to steadily increase. At the end of 2019, minorities represented over 30% of the permanent workforce and women accounted for approximately 45%. The FDIC has also increased diversity across our leadership. Minorities held 22% of the management level positions and women hold 39% up from almost 16% and 30% respectively 10 years ago. Likewise, my senior leadership team comprises a diverse set of individuals. Notwithstanding, we know more needs to be done and we're fully committed to doing it. As we consider additional ways to create a more inclusive banking system, we must recognize the tremendous benefits that financial innovation can deliver to consumers. Our recent biennial survey on household use of banking and financial services shows that individuals are increasingly moving, moving to digital banking. To enable this evolution, we established an Office of Innovation, FDI Tech, and began working on several initiatives. Notably, we recently sought feedback on a groundbreaking approach to facilitate technology partnerships between banks and fintechs which aims to reduce the cost and uncertainty associated with the introduction of new technology at an institution. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify today, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Chair McWilliams. Uh, Vice Chairman Quarles, you are now recognized for five minutes to present your oral testimony. Thank you. 
Thank you, uh, Chairwoman Waters, Ranking Member McHenry, members of the committee, uh, for the opportunity to testify today on the Federal Reserve supervisory activities. Uh, my last appearance before this committee in May uh, followed a period of historic financial stress. The emergence of COVID-19 and the measures taken in response added a deep strain of uncertainty to financial markets. They prompted a sharp and global flight from riskier, more volatile asset classes and a retreat to the safety of cash. That retreat demanded immediate, extraordinary, and concerted public intervention to ensure stability, restore calm, and see the nation through an unfolding crisis. The Federal Reserve's intervention spanned a wide range of intermediaries and markets, including the banking sector. Strengthened by a decade of improvements in capital, liquidity, and risk management, including the refinement and recalibration of the last three years, banking organizations became an important shelter from financial distress. Our goal was to ensure this shelter stood fast, that banks could respond to the emergency and address consumer, business, and community needs without jeopardizing their own safety and soundness. The report accompanying my testimony lists these actions in detail, and we've extended several of them as the COVID event has continued. They include temporary adjustments to capital and reserve measures, compliance requirements, uh, they include offsite examination activities. Certainly, they clarify beyond doubt that safety and soundness are no impediment to working constructively with borrowers and other customers in times of strain. Together with monetary financial, these regulatory measures helped calm the waters. The initial wave of market stress has passed and the recovery has begun. To even the greatest of effects. The challenge we face now is distinct, formidable, and complex. The surprise of the COVID event is gone, replaced by a clearer view of its economic consequences. The burdens facing households and businesses are better understood, but they're no less significant, and they're not evenly borne. I'm confident that we'll work through them together, support those hardest hit, and ensure that our economic wounds do not become scars. The Federal Reserve remains committed to using our full range of tools to support the economy for as long as needed. A strong, resilient banking system is an essential element of such support. A durable recovery demands banks that lend actively, confront gains and losses honestly, withstand unexpected shocks and help customers rebuild and adapt. Our task as supervisors is to ensure that the country's banks continue to meet that exacting standard. The Federal Reserve's earliest COVID-related guidance, encouraging banks to work constructively with borrowers, was an important step toward this goal. Since then, working with our colleagues and other financial regulatory agencies, from principles to guide COVID-related credit accommodation, to a clearer statement on Community Reinvestment Act consideration of COVID-related activities, to steps that make it easier for banks to participate in emergency lending programs. It also includes the use of the flexibility in our stress testing apparatus to better understand the effects of the COVID event shock on the strength of banking organizations. As our report shows, that strength is still intact. Liquidity and capital remain high and indeed have increased at our largest banks over the course of the COVID event. Firms have sharply increased their reserves, setting aside resources today against possible losses tomorrow. Banks are well positioned to serve as a bulwark against broader financial and economic stress. It's worth recognizing how things might have been different. This foundation would not exist after a once in a century shock, if not for a decade of work by officials and the banks themselves to make banks stronger and more stable and to make banking supervision fairer, more efficient and more transparent. Those values are not contingent, but only for an economic boom. They represent an ethic and a commitment to addressing the most pressing supervisory and regulatory issues in the most effective ways that are even more critical during a crisis. That ethic has steered the Federal Reserve through the last seven months, and it will continue to guide us through the recovery. COVID-19 changed many aspects of the Federal Reserve's work. It also affirmed the values and priorities that remain the same, those that will continue to guide us in our support for the financial system, the economy, and the country long after the COVID event has passed. Thank you for your time, and I look forward to answering your questions. Is it on? The Vice Chairman calls. Uh, Acting Comptroller Brooks, you are now recognized for five minutes to present your oral testimony. 
Chairwoman Waters, uh, Ranking Mc uh, Member McHenry, members of the committee and staff, thank you so much for the opportunity to update you today on the OCC's work ensuring that federal banks operate in a safe, sound, and fair manner and remain sources of strength for their communities. Over the past eight months, the OCC has supported the orderly function of our banking system through an extraordinary time. Fortunately, banks and savings association entered this period with near historic high levels of capital and liquidity. Asset quality was strong, and the economy had enjoyed the longest expansion on record. And then, as part of the national response to COVID-19, economic activity was suspended. Regulators at this table collaborated to provide banks the flexibility necessary for them to use that strength to support their, consumer, their customers and to sustain economic activity. My testimony today will provide detail on the actions the agency has taken on this front. Now, today, we continue to monitor the effects of shutting down the economy. While banks remain sound, we see potential for troubled assets ahead in commercial and residential real estate, small business and consumer lending, and travel and hospitality sectors. Banks, particularly those with concentrations in those assets, must take a sober view of their risks and work with customers to the maximum extent possible consistent with safety and soundness. The recent OCC semi-annual risk perspective highlights the credit, operational, and compliance risks in the system, which will focus our supervisory efforts in the months ahead. Prudent risk management today can avoid the need for more extreme loss mitigation tomorrow. Having said that, we also see reasons for cautious optimism about the future based on strong third quarter GDP growth, continuing reduction in unemployment, strong consumer and small business sentiment, and better than expected news about the near-term availability of effective COVID-19 vaccines. While the economy and banks clearly face uncertainty as to the length and depth of the pandemic's trough, I also want to highlight what gives me optimism for the future of banking and, frankly, for the future of the country. During the social unrest that followed the killing of George Floyd this summer, it became clear that the protesters were angry, among other reasons, because too many Americans have been left out of our national wealth creation engine for far too long. The OCC founded Project REACH for just this purpose, to convene bankers, civil rights leaders, innovators, and business people to promote full, fair, and equal participation in our economy. The project is working to eliminate obstacles to credit for 45 million people with no usable credit score, to expand affordable housing for those who cannot afford high down payment requirements, and to reinvigorate minority banks that serve often neglected communities. And we've now kicked off regional reach efforts, including one serving the greater Los Angeles area, Chairwoman Waters, that you and I both call home. And we've hosted events uh, on access to capital and credit in places ranging from South Carolina to Colorado. I've been humbled by the momentum among the industry, community and civil rights advocates, and our staff. Indeed, Project REACH has become a movement to tear down barriers so that all may pursue their American dreams. Another reason for my optimism comes from innovators within banks and elsewhere who are excited about improving banking and financial services to consumers, businesses, and communities. We're seeing new products and better ways of delivering them and much more efficient ways of operating. Ultimately, this progress will benefit consumers and businesses as people have greater choice and more autonomy over their financial well-being. At the OCC, we believe that consumers, businesses, and the economy are best served when this innovation can occur within the banking system, and the system is allowed to evolve as consumer preferences evolve. Now, we think this for several reasons. First, the banking system is among our most strictly regulated and most closely supervised industries. Those who fear innovation may harm consumers should consider the possibility that innovation might be safer in a supervised environment than it is under the currently largely unsupervised one. The same is true for those focused on prudential risk. Over the last decade, it's clear that large market shares of lending and payments have migrated from the commercial banks into less regulated shadow banks. This trend reduces our collective ability to spot and manage issues early on. And of course, we should not underestimate the risk of a status quo in which incumbents seek protection from competition and thus delay the delivery of innovative financial services that are already available in other parts of the world. The OCC has been a leader in this area since coining the phrase responsible innovation in 2015. We remain committed to encouraging responsible efforts to deliver more choice and more economic opportunities in safe, sound, and fair ways within the federal banking system to benefit consumers and businesses across the country. Thank you again for this opportunity. I'm very proud to have served as acting controller of the currency and to support the agency's important mission. I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Uh, I will now recognize myself for five minutes for questions. Um, first, let me uh, just ask each of you 
about the deregulatory efforts that you have made during this pandemic, uh, despite the fact uh, that this committee uh, specifically asked you not to do that. I won't go into all of the deregulations, but simply I'd like to ask each of you, uh, would you commit to freezing these deregulatory actions? Uh, let's go right down uh, the roll on this and ask each of you if you would agree to freeze uh, the re deregulatory actions that you have taken. We'll start with Mr. Brooks. Well, Chairman Waters, th thank you for the question. I, I guess I don't perceive what we've done at the OCC as particularly deregulatory. We have regulated uh, true lender in ways that solve the rent -a charter problem by holding banks accountable for their marketplace lending partnerships. We have provided lists of community reinvestment activities to make clear which things will count. We have fined banks record numbers of dollars and fined individual bank executives in ways that have never been done before to hold them accountable. Okay, all right, uh, reclaiming my time here. Uh, you're saying no, that you don't feel that you have done anything that's deregulatory. I hear that. Uh, Chair Mac Williams, what about you? Uh, Chairwoman, I'm afraid that you don't want us to stop because some of the things that we have done actually have ensured that borrowers and consumers, especially low and moderate income people, can stay in their homes. And so we have done a number of things to either satisfy the uh, the will of Congress that you implemented through the CARES Act or to ensure that our regulated entities have an opportunity to work with their borrowers proactively and not have a repeat right. of the 2008 I, 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 financial okay. crisis. All right, fine. So you're saying no, also, you don't feel that what you have done is deregulatory. Uh, Chair Qualls? Uh, yes, the changes that we've made have been designed to uh, ensure that the right incentives are in place to ensure we have a, a resilient financial system. And I think as we uh, consider the resilience of the financial system, uh, we should we should be willing to do what's necessary to keep it safe and sound. Thank you, Chair Hood. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, all of our efforts have been to provide regulatory relief and flexibility so credit unions can serve their members during the time of the pandemic. Every action I've taken to date is to do things such as providing the loan forbearance. In fact, credit unions have now made over 1.7 million loan forbearance loans to the amount of $55 billion. Okay, so thank you. If I may interrupt, you don't feel that you have done anything that's deregulatory. Is that right? Only to aid the credit union member owners. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, I, I want to just go now to uh, Chair uh, Mac Williams. You know, we talk a lot about diversity and inclusion. And I am very interested in what is happening uh, with our small banks, some of the community banks. Is it true uh, that we have banks that are basically closing down, uh, they're leaving banking, or is that just a rumor? Um, Chairwoman, I, when you say banks uh, closing down as community in- Community banks. Community banks. So there has been a great uh, uh, consolidation trend uh, for years now, and, and as you're probably aware, we probably lose about 220, 202 to 220 uh, community banks to mergers every year. So yes, the uh, banks are community now, banking. Any of, any, of those banks, banks, any of those banks that you described as having merged, have you had the opportunity to interact with Blacks or uh, Latinx about bank ownership and acquisition of banks that are being merged? Yes, yes, we have. And actually, one of the key uh, components of our MDI, Minority Depository Institution, outreach efforts and uh, in pursuit of our mandate to preserve and promote them has been to look in the ways that would provide that, a res that, that, that an entity that is being sold, uh, that is either failing oh, or really? just about to be sold. Have you, have, you, have you been involved in any acquisitions uh, by MDIs or Latinx uh, uh, bankers? We, we are in constant discussions with our MDI banks. Have you been when, successful at any? Yeah, I would say know yes. Of any acquisitions that have been made by uh, MDIs or Latinx bankers? Yes. Would you tell me which ones they are, please? We don't know of any, and I've I'm really interested in this. I would be happy to provide you that information. I don't have the information in front of me, but I'm in active discussions with 
a number of MDI banks uh, to make sure that they have an opportunity to acquire failing uh, but MDI that's banks. That's my question. And, and if you have been successful, I want to know about it because we're talking about wealth building and we're talking about opening up opportunities that have not been available in the financial systems. And so I want to know more about this and whether or not you actually have a program by which you will be outreaching to ensure that these opportunities are opening up to MDIs. So I want to thank you very much. And I want to go now uh, to um, to call on uh, our ranking member for questions. You have five minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, what I'd like to first say to this group of regulators and uh, is, is that I've followed and we have, this committee has followed very closely your actions um, since uh, this unprecedented pandemic has hit this country and the world. And we have, uh, and I have great confidence that the actions that you've taken have made a very challenging situation, a very challenging health situation that has become a challenging economic situation. That that because of your actions, we've we've been able to prevent a financial crisis. Um, and without your concerted action, until the final moment that you're in your seats. The American people would be in a, in a tougher position than they're, they're currently in. So what I want to ask you to do and to commit to do is to the fullness of your terms of office, that you do the business that you've set out to do to, to ensure the safety and soundness of institutions, that the American people uh, can have confidence that their regulators are on the job, watching out for them and taking every action necessary to prevent uh, bad outcomes. Um, and so uh, I, I, I commend you for that action, but I also urge you to continue uh, this, this good work. Um, to that end, the, the work of the Federal Reserve has been foremost in this, in this discussion. Um, and so, uh, Chair Quarles, I want to uh, commend you for the actions of the Federal Reserve uh, since March, especially. Uh, but I, we also need to know this this process going forward. And so, um, as I've mentioned before and raised with you before, uh, we want a clear understanding of uh, uh, of the of the path forward on LIBOR. Uh, this is an important rate uh, for for a number of financial uh, uh, products, looking at over 200 trillion uh, uh, notional value for contracts. Um, and uh, we know that LIBOR is ending at the end of 2021. So can you give us uh, some assurance about your process going forward? Uh, yes, I'd be happy to do that. I think we're, uh, the, the issue that you've raised, I think is uh, an important one from a stability point of view, which is that there are, uh, a lot of legacy contracts uh, that currently rely on LIBOR uh, that, you know, the, that we need to define a path forward for them after the end of 2021. Uh, the transition for new contracts is going pretty smoothly. Uh, the legacy contract is, uh, is the big issue there. Um, I think finding a way to allow those legacy contracts to continue uh, uh, for at least some period to allow the bulk of those legacy contracts to mature uh, on their existing terms uh, without a significant change uh, would probably be the best way forward. Um, uh, and we are working on a method to do that. There are a variety of different ways uh, one could do that, but I would expect over the next couple of months to be able to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, publicly define uh, the way forward to address that. Thank you, Vice Chair Quarles. And at this point, do you have a legislative request uh, or a need for legislative action uh, by um, the, the the Congress? I think that uh, I, I think that the ultimate uh, transition will ultimately require some legislative element. Uh, but at this point, I think the answer would be no, because I think it's good to, I, I think we, what we want to try to do is find a way uh, 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 to, uh, to allow those contracts to mature before we have a legislative solution for the so-called hard tail. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Chair McWilliams, I want to commend you for the action you've taken to modernize the FDIC uh, to use, um, to focus on financial innovation. Um, and use technology to keep your people uh, safe and secure, and yet also our institutions safe and secure. 
Mr. Brooks, I want to commend you for the action you've taken on um, uh, on OCC's true lender rulemaking uh, to provide certainty and clarity on those uh, partnerships um, uh, that are very important for our current economy. Can you, can you, uh, Mr. Brooks, at the top line, uh, describe how that rule will work in practice and why it's a good thing? Uh, well, uh, Ranking Member McHenry, thanks for the question. <clears throat> Two quick top lines. First of all, the purpose of the rule is to redress what happened in, late, in light of the Madden rule, which reduced the availability of credit to low and moderate income Americans by as much as 64%. And so allowing banks to leverage their balance sheets will solve that. We've also addressed the rent-a-charter problem by making clear that banks that do those partnerships are accountable for all consumer compliance obligations. Well, thank you. Thanks for your testimony. Thank you all for being here or being wherever you are. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, um, Ms. Velasquez, Ms. Maloney of New York. Uh, you're recognized for five minutes. Madam Chair, and congratulations on your reelection and to all of my colleagues. It's uh, great to be back at business. Uh, my question is for FDIC Chairwoman uh, McWilliams. Uh, uh, due to the COVID crisis, it's a threat to our economy. It will not go away until we have a vaccine. Uh, so we should be using every tool at our disposal to guarantee the safety of our banking system. Uh, during the Great Depression, over 400 banks failed. And one of the most important uh, lessons we learned from that time was the need for banks to shore up uh, sufficient capital to withstand severe economic downturns. And, and um uh, Chair, Chairwoman Williams, my question for you is, given the positive correlation between economic downturns and bank failures, are you expecting an increase in bank failures at this time? Thank you for that question. Um, the bottom line is that uh, fortunately, and fortunately for me at this time, uh, we entered the pandemic uh, and the related financial crisis uh, caused by the government shutdowns uh, with banks very well capitalized, with high liquidity levels, the lowest number of banks on the problem bank list. Thus far this year, we have had four banks fail. Historically, when we look at our data uh, during good times, we have about five banks fail a year. So I would say we're on trend for just a normal year thus far, which truly shows the resiliency of the financial system. And, and as highlighted by Vice Chairman Quarles in his opening statement, uh, we're grateful for the efforts of the banks to shore up their capital uh, balances and, and liquidity um, uh, during the good times, and we're certainly monitoring conditions on the ground to make sure that, sure that they can do what they need to do. But I also want to highlight that I'm not sure we would be in as good of a place as we are right now if we did not take a number of regulatory actions over the past few months to make sure that banks can stay in the business of banking and that, for example, uh, loans that were modified for the purposes of the pandemic that were performing before the pandemic would not constitute trouble debt restructuring. And if I can just highlight real briefly, uh, during the 2008 uh, crisis, the reason banks were not uh, really eager to modify loans up front is because they weren't sure how the regulators are going to treat those loans and they didn't want to have non-performing loans and impaired debt on their books. So it was imperative for us to act quickly and promptly to make sure that we have good banks uh, that are serving their communities, that consumers can stay in their homes, and that frankly, the FDIC doesn't have to um, um, jump into action with more bank closures than, than absolutely necessary. Well, uh, some, some countries have uh, prohibited dividend payments uh, to shield their banks. Uh, do you believe that prohibiting dividend payments would help uh, our banks uh, shield them from failure, uh, uh, forcing them to hold on to more of their capital? Uh, sure. A, a great question. And I will tell you, that with, with respect to small banks, community banks, a lot of those banks are uh, privately held. Uh, their investors are friends and family. Um, you know, th there are local farmers, uh, school teachers, et cetera, who sit on the boards of those banks and actually have ownership in, in the banking system. So having a blunt cut uh, instrument such as just across the board dividend uh, um, uh, for, I would say, um, a stop uh, would probably hurt those communities and, and uh, the investors in community banks. We have supervisory tools where we can manage dividend payouts if we're concerned about the bank's uh, capital position. And we have certainly utilized those tools in the past as appropriate. Well, uh, now my question to Vice Chair Quarles, if I have the time, uh, during your latest uh, stress test, it found that several banks could be at risk of reaching minimum uh, capital levels. Uh, as a result, the Fed banned stock buybacks, but only limited dividend payments by the largest banks. 
to safeguard up their, their solvency. Uh, so given the, the, the continued uncertainty uh, of, of, a, of a really the, the crisis with COVID, um, do you think that uh, the Fed should have prevented, prevent, prohibited dividend payments entirely? Uh, well, during this period, given the capital conservation measures that we put in place, the uh, capital positions of the largest banks have actually increased, uh, even while they've been taking record levels of provisions. Uh, and we're running stress tests currently uh, in light of the events of the spring and the effects of that on bank balance sheets uh, in order to uh, determine uh, at the granular bank level what we think the uh, effects of potential future losses might be. Uh, so I think we've been in, in a pretty good position. I think the, the, that events have demonstrated that the measures we've taken have been uh, effective. Uh, I believe my time has expired and I yield back. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now recognize uh, Mr. Lucas for five minutes. Mr. Lucas, you recognize. If Mr. Lucas is not available, uh, I will go to Mr. Posey for five minutes. I can't hear you. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair. Uh, during times of stress for our financial institutions and markets, we have the obligation to temper safety and soundness so that our potential fears over an event like this pandemic do not go us into adopting such stringent prudential standards that we exacerbate the stress. Uh, I had the same concerns related to the troubled debt restructuring and associated accounting standards during our recovery from the financial crisis. Uh, Madam Chair, you and I co-sponsored a bill to address these concerns during the recovery from the financial crisis. Uh, as you know, the bill plays common sense parameters around putting loan modifications, often called troubled debt restructures, or TRDs, into non-accrual status. Uh, that status negatively impacts capital requirements, and it pushes banks away from working with customers facing difficulties and more toward extreme solutions such as foreclosure. I was so pleased that this committee worked together in a bipartisan manner to mitigate the impacts of accounting practices on, on troubled debt restructuring in the CARES Act. Uh, we need to extend that relief for a while longer, though I have concerns about uh, <clears throat> tying that extension to sweeping expansion of consumer forbearance for a wide variety of credit and such as credit cards and installation loans, installment loans. Uh, as we know, forbearance for one entity in the chain of financial transaction creates yet another potential liquidity crisis for subsequent people. And we have other bills here today I uh, like the treatment of PPP loans that I believe have merit. Uh, for Mr. Quarles, uh, as I mentioned, there is there is uh, legislation before the committee to extend the pandemic-related uh, relaxation of accounting standards associated with the troubled debt restructuring. This provision was included in the CARES Act. Uh, the language allowed banks and credit unions to provide relief to consumers and businesses by temporarily removing the burdensome troubled debt restructuring uh, classification requirement. Uh, financial institutions that elect to take advantage of this provision would be required to provide forbearance to consumers for a wide variety of loans, including installment debt and credit cards. Small businesses would also be afforded forbearance for a wide array of, of loans. The bill would impose conditions on how the loan balances deferred in forbearance could be repaid. Uh, I'm interested in your candid evaluation. Uh, what would be uh, the Fed's concerns about such forbearance, if any? Uh, well, thank you. Uh, thanks for that question. I think the um, uh, well, the current uh, uh, forbearance provisions, as you know, obviously, um, uh, will allow any uh, uh, any changes, any uh, adjustments that are made before the end of this year, uh, they can be for uh, whatever length uh, that, the, uh, that the bank and the borrower 
uh, would agree. So, so the uh, forbearance doesn't really end at the end of this year. It's the uh, ability to make new changes at the end at the end of this year. Um, I do think that in general, it is uh, it's good for us to move uh, as promptly as possible to uh, regular order. Uh, where uh, the challenges that are facing uh, banks, uh, given the position of their borrowers, uh, are uh, are at least uh, recognized. Um, so, at least what we're seeing right now is uh, not a, a as, as banks begin to understand the fact that the the uh, the uh, uh, the forbearance uh, that is available under the law doesn't end at the end of the year, but simply that they may, must make their decisions by the end of the year. Uh, we aren't getting a lot of pressure, at least at the Federal Reserve, uh, for that extension, but ultimately that would be a decision for Congress. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, I had a couple more questions, but by the time I ask the questions, there's not going to be time to answer them, so I'll, I'll uh, yield the balance of my time. Ms. Velasquez, you're recognized for five minutes. If Ms. Velasquez is not available, uh, we will go on to Mr. Lukemeyer uh, for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. I would be willing to yield to Mr. Lucas, who's uh, above me and and rank here, because I think he missed his mute button a while ago. If he, if he's found his mute button, he, he can take the spot and I'll follow up in a moment. Thank you. Mr. Lucas, you're ready for five minutes. <coughs> Mr. Lucas? I don't know. Apparently he hasn't found the, the mute button yet, but. <laughs> we'll let him continue to look while we go on, Mr. Lucamar. Okay, thank you very much. All right. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And we'd just like to, uh, first, before I begin my question, I'd like to applaud all of you, the, the regulators this morning, for uh, proposing to codify the 2018 uh, interagency statement on guidance and, and place a binding rule on the agencies that supervisory guidance does not have the force and effect of law. This has been something I've consistently worked on in Congress. I look forward to continuing work with you all uh, to draw a clear line between rule and guidance and what is enforceable and what is not. So I appreciate your, your uh, attention to that. I look forward to continuing work with you. Uh, to follow up Mr. Posey's uh, conversation with regards to trouble debt restructuring, <clears throat> you know, I, I have a bill out there to, to do this as well. And I'm very concerned that at the end of the year when we run out of, when the CARES Act sunsets, the TDR provision that's in there, that um, the regulators will have minimal options to uh, nothing to point to legislatively or, 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 or with any sort of other law to say that they can take a different approach on this. I can tell you in discussing this with the banking industry folks uh, and the, um, the credit union folks that they're very concerned about, um, you know, having to rely on guidance, having to rely on, on uh, something like that to make these decisions and whether to give forbearance to their customers, whether it be for home loans, car loans, or their business loans. Uh, <clears throat> so I guess, Chairman Williams, you and I have talked about this at length, but just to get you on record here with what we're talking about, where are you and what are your plans with regards to uh, TDR gui guidance and how you want to work with the, 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 the your set of regulators and the people they regulate, which are the banks, and hopefully their customers who will be impacted by those uh, decisions? Well, thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for that question. Uh, as, as you know from our discussions, uh, back in March, I was really concerned about um, uh, loans not being modified and banks being concerned about having impaired debt. And driven by the examples from 2008, where some of these loans, uh, once, in, once, once uh, modified, were treated as impaired debt or trouble debt restructuring, they're still performing now, 10 years later, 12 years later, but they're still on books as trouble debt, which doesn't bode well for the bank. 
So driven by that, we have worked with among these regulatory body uh, bodies here at the, at, uh, uh, at the table, I would say, but uh, on the screen, we have worked with the Financial Accounting Standards Board to make sure that uh, our banks can modify uh, loans that were performing prior to the pandemic and not have TDRs on the books. And then subsequently Congress enacted similar provisions in the CARES Act. So I would say that that's probably one of the main reasons that you have seen homeowners stay in their homes and small businesses have access to credit during very, very tumultuous months in March and, and April. And we're cer certainly open to considering what additional uh, actions Congress may come up with to make sure that, that we can enable banks to work with their borrowers. Well, I thank you for that. I, I can assure you that the institutions certainly uh, and desperately need to have certainty on this on forbearance, forbearance because uh, if they're not able to get it from the regulators, it's going to be very difficult for them to give it to their customers. So we thank you for that. Um, I know Mr. Hood, uh, Chairman Hood, you uh, had an article, I think, last week in, uh, in your uh, Credit Union Times um, magazine and uh with regards to cecil and i appreciate that info that uh, the position you took again indicating that uh, cecil is going to be detrimental to the credit union folks that it needs to uh be done away with uh it, it's going to be pro um, uh, pro cyclical and i know um uh, mr quarles you and i have talked about this as well quite a bit and uh, uh i see where you know we're uh, we're three quarters into the, the year here now with Cecil data. I know the bigger banks at the very beginning of the year actually had to roll over another 30, 35% into the reserves. And while that's fine, uh, eventually that stresses stresses out the, uh, the income. So would you like to comment on it just a little bit, please? Sorry, the mute button wasn't uh, quite responding. Um, yeah, the... Um, um, uh, well, as you know, uh, we have uh, immediately as a result of uh, the COVID event uh, extended uh, the transition period so that uh, for, uh, uh, for smaller banks, the, um, uh, the, 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 they'll be insulated from the capital effects of Cecil for two years and then a three-year phase that would begin. I do think that that gives us the ability to uh, uh, to understand uh, what has happened and what the implications of Cecil are, uh, particularly as we see it operating with uh, larger banks, uh, and we can then make any adjust permanent adjustments that we think are necessary. I see my time is up. Thank you very much. I appreciate uh, Chairman Hood's position on it as well. I yield back. I now recognize Mr. Sherman for five minutes. Thank you. A um, couple of comments. Uh, Ranking member Lukemeyer uh, said in his statement that our economy grew at 33%, that it grew 33%. Uh, the more accurate way to say that is that we grew at 8% during the third quarter. Um, I don't know if you can extrapolate that. And of course, that was only a halfway bounce back from a terrible second quarter. This crisis uh, continues. Um, during uh, this crisis, it makes sense to have limits on the stock buybacks and the uh, uh, dividends paid by large banks. Uh, that's why I wrote uh, you, Mr. Quarles, uh, back in early March, urging that you uh, uh, prohibit uh, dividends and stock repurchases by mega banks uh, during this crisis. You have, in fact, uh, taken uh, some action, and uh, particularly on stock buybacks, and I hope uh, that we can count on you to continue to limit uh, stock buybacks and dividends as well until this crisis is over so that we are not confronted with the need to, or the, at least the asserted need, to bail out uh, uh, huge financial institutions. Um, we've talked about the troubled debt uh, restructuring uh, relief which allows banks to uh, restructure their debt to aid consumers and small businesses without being uh, penalized. Uh, this uh, CARES Act provision expires at the end of this year, though we've heard testimony that it could be applied next year to forbearance agreed to this year, but there may be forbearance agreed to next year. Uh, so I'd uh, ask uh, Mr. Brooks, 
do you have the authority uh, to extend uh, this loan modification flexibility uh, for loan modifications made uh, during the 2021 part of this COVID crisis? And if you do, do you ex uh, do you plan to uh, exercise that authority? <clears throat> well, uh, Congressman Sherman, thank you for that question. These are really important issues. And what I tell you is there there's certain aspects of this where without an extension of the CARES Act, um, we would have statutory uh, inability to do certain things, right? And that is because we're statutorily required to hold banks accountable for gap financial reporting. On the other hand, we have significant flexibility to protect banks from the impact of, of TDR treatment under various uh, categories. And I think we've communicated some of these to your colleagues in writing. These include things, for example, like determining what uh, TDR uh, impact is immaterial, which is then excluded from the gap TDR standards. It also includes uh, things like making determinations about yeah. when banks would be required to refile a call report or not. And so there are a number of things we can do to mitigate effects, but to actually- I, I, I hope very much that we pass additional legislation. I know that even before we passed legislation, you had a regulation project, which means you had the authority before we acted. Hopefully you'll have that authority after our actions are no longer effective, unless of course we're able to extend them, which I hope uh, the wisdom will perhaps arise in the United States Senate, anything is possible. Um, as to LIBOR, we've got $2 trillion of legacy LIBOR. Most of those uh, instruments do not provide a replacement rate to be used in calculating the amount of interest payable once LIBOR is no longer published at the end of next year. Some of those instruments provide that the lender gets to pick the rate which would be an outrage uh, if you're the borrower and all of a sudden some new rate is imposed on you. And that's why the National Consumer Law Center, the Student Borrower Protection Group, et cetera, is very concerned about this, uh, uh, as is, I think, uh, uh, the financial services community as well. So um, I, I know there's some discussion as to whether uh, legislation is necessary. I clearly think it is in that I don't know how if the instrument does not indicate how interest is to be calculated, uh, anything other than legislation could uh, could solve that problem. Um, I've put forward a discussion draft uh, and uh, it, it reflects uh, the uh, suggestions of the alternative reference rate committee. Um, what, uh, what would be the uh, consequence, uh, Mr. Quarles, of uh, simply uh, uh, not having uh, any uh, any regulatory or legislative solution uh, would this uh, result in an awful lot of class action lawsuits, et cetera? Uh, if, if there were no solution at all, uh, yes, when we uh, when LIBOR stops, uh, there would be significant disruption. I think that there is a way, uh, as I indicated in my answer to uh, uh, Mr. Henry, that um, uh, that we can combine current uh, current measures that allow the bulk of the existing contracts to mature on their uh, existing terms uh, yeah. and then save legislation for the hard tail when we've had more time to think about it, that may work best. Well, this time has I think expired. we need to act on it. I yield back. Thank you. I will now recognize Mr. Meeks for five minutes. Mr. Meeks. Thank you, Madam Chair. First, I want to thank you, Madam Chair, as well as Ranking Member McKenzie for your active engagement on bills that I drafted, which I believe were some of the most uh, impactful bills in support of minority banks and community development financial institutions in a generation. Similarly, I want to thank uh, with an express gratitude as each of the regulatory agencies present here today offered constructive input into these bills. Uh, we haven't always agreed. And in fact, we've had some deep, deep, deep disagreements, but I believe with conviction that these bills matter and that the co collaborative approach is critical as we seek to redress structural discrimination and systemic inequalities that hold back too many families across our country. MDIs and CDFIs are central pillars to tackling the systemic problems that we seek to solve. So to that, let me go to Chairwoman McWilliams. Uh, would you agree that MDIs and CDFIs are key pillars to addressing the issues of inequality and discrimination in our banking system? 
And, you know, also, I guess, but thereby commit that the FDIC would work actively to implement the provisions of uh, this legislation that's signed into law? Thank you for that question. I will say that um, community banks serve their communities. That's why they're called community banks. But in particular, minority depository institutions are at the very forefront of serving their communities. And those communities happen to be low and moderate income and uh, people of color. So I would say that they are not just pillars in their community, but in many cases, they're the only vehicle to get financial services for uh, the communities that have traditionally been underserved and underrepresented in the banking system. So we are working very hard to make sure that those banks um, can sustain themselves, that we do what we can at the FDIC to make sure that they have regulatory flexibility and the creation of the fund that um, I briefly discussed in the opening statement um, would hopefully help MDIs and CDFIs get additional capital. They really need capital. And uh, so, so, you know, we thought about, well, we can do a number of things on the regulatory side, but, you know, they seem to be getting deposits from uh, non-MDIs. They seem to be getting some assistance on the technical side, but they really need capital. So the idea behind this fund is to um, provide the resources and have others invest into MDI institutions and CDFIs so that they can continue to support our communities. So, and I couldn't agree with you more, and I think that your initiatives, you know, which is supporting aspiring minority investors in MDIs, and so that you can, they can strengthen their capacity, uh, but it's also to, to, to strengthen the capacity of MDIs to acquire branches or operations of failing institutions. Now, I think this is key because without de novo banks, uh, we are on a path for the disappearance of minority banks, which is what I'm afraid of, because uh, I fear that minority banks and that investors are being steered solely to the most challenging markets of failing institutions. Can you elaborate a little bit more on how we can expand the number of de novo minority banks and support them in expanding and achieving scale? Because we see the numbers dwindling, and even as they merge, they dwindle more so that there'd be less communities or less banks uh, that's available throughout the United States of, of America. So what can we do to expand and have more uh, MDIs uh, uh, created? Sure, and that's a, gr a great question. And that really, your question has two components. One is, what can we do to make sure that the failing uh, banks or the branches that are being sold of MDI banks go to MDI so that those, those communities continue to be served by minority deposit institutions? And I ran a little bit out of time uh, when Chairwoman uh, Waters uh, asked that question. But we have changed the way that um, MDIs can bid and, on, and get technical assistance on failing MDIs so that they have additional time, they have two extra weeks when they open up the books of the failing bank only to MDIs. And while non-MDIs have to wait for, the, for their time two weeks later, but we want to give them that advantage, that, that window uh, of time for them to analyze and prepare bids for the failing uh, MDI, which frankly uh, is going to result in more MDIs that are failing or selling, uh, uh, you know, partially their businesses are, are offered an opportunity to uh, go to other MDIs. On the de novo front, I couldn't agree more with you. Uh, we need more new banks. And uh, frankly, you know, some of these communities, rural communities in particular, and, and, and MDIs, um, there just aren't enough of them. And so we have done a number of things at the FDIC to ensure that we have changed the way that we process and approve the NOVA applications for deposit insurance so that there is an increased ability in the agility of investors and the organizers to have new banks. So I'm happy to give you more information in detail. I understand our time may be up, but thank you for that question. Thank you. I look forward to following up with you. Thank you. Mr. Lucas. Let's try one more time, Madam Chairman. Can okay. you hear my voice? Okay. Mr. Lucas, are you available for your five minutes? Yes, ma'am. If you okay. can hear You're me, ready. I'm available. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. PPP is a very important program in my district, and I think it's very important to the survival of all businesses across this great country. And throughout the course of the pandemic, the banking system has served as a source of strength and a lifeline for struggling businesses across the country. And those banks have played a critical role in supporting small businesses through that Paycheck Protro Protect Protect Protection Program, distributing more than a half a billion dollars. As a result, many banks are at risk of crossing asset-based regulatory thresholds. What discretionary authorities does the Federal Reserve, FDIC, and OCC have to ensure that banks do not face additional regulatory burdens as a result 
of doing the important thing of participating in PPC. Can I first turn to you, Vice Chairman Corals, and then Chairman uh, McWilliams, and then uh, Controller Brooks, please, for your observations? Uh, thank you, uh, and thanks for that question. Uh, yes, we have been uh, looking that issue uh, at that issue. I think you're uh, exactly right. Uh, the various thresholds for the imposition of various uh, regulatory measures uh, exist uh, for what are intended to be a sort of durable and, and permanent changes in the status of a bank uh, and uh, temporary expansion of their positions, particularly in, in a time of stress and when they're supporting their customers. Uh, I think we need to look at how to address that. We do have uh, the ability to provide temporary uh, exemptions for most of these, and we are considering doing that. And I would just add to that, that uh, to the extent that uh, the FDIC has sole authority over some of these things, uh, we have already acted and we will continue to act. I would say that it so shows that the, the financial system uh, has served as a source of strength. The fact that over $1 trillion of new deposits have flocked to banks for each quarter since the beginning of the year in Q1 and Q2. We haven't gotten the data yet from, from Q3 uh, and, and as soon as we have it uh, completed, we'll, we'll analyze it and provide it to the public. But we're talking about over $2 trillion. And so what we have done at the FDIC is um, exempt from the deposit assessments, uh, any uh, any any assets that have come to banks by virtue of their originations of the PPP loans through the Fed facility, and we will continue to work with our fellow regulators to continue to do so. Absolutely, Controller. Uh, Congressman, thanks. Thank you for that question. I, I guess the other examples I would add on to what's already been said are, first of all, we made changes in the way that the supplemental leverage ratio is calculated specifically to make it easier for banks to not have capital impacts of, of these kinds of things. And in addition to that, there's ongoing interagency work across our three agencies to make sure that regulatory burdens that, that um, get tripped at different asset thresholds starting at $500 million get a temporary exclusion of these kinds of assets so that banks below $10 billion don't find themselves in a harder regulatory climate. We haven't rolled those out finally yet, but we're hard at work on that at the staff level and expect we'll roll that out before the end of the year. Ever so briefly, Chairman Hood, can you speak to the effect of PPP loans on the credit union balance sheets? Yes, uh, all of the PPP loans receive a 0% risk rating uh, in calculating the net worth. And then I'd also add is that we by statute could only assess share insurance fund premiums based on credit union insured shares and not assets. So therefore they don't have an impact on the balance sheets as well. And in addition, credit unions originated over 171,000 PPP loans. So I'm okay. glad that we as a board were able to make those provisions. Thank you, Chairman. And I wanna thank the Chairman Woman for her indulgence and Ranking Member Luke from Breyer's efforts to help me as I work through my technical questions. I would offer one final thought, and that is to all my colleagues, be healthy, be safe. While some of my children may think I was around for the 1930 election, on election night, the Republicans had 218 seats, a majority. By the time Congress organized in March through deaths and special elections, the Democrats had a 219 seat majority. If a podcast of a nonpartisan news source was correct that I listened to this morning, and the difference will be three seats, we're in that kind of an environment. 1930 all over again. Just a thought to my friends in the majority and the minority. You're back, Madam Chair. Well, thank you very much. And we'll count on those three seats so to be there when we need them. Uh, Mr. Clay, <laughs> you're now recognized for five minutes. <laughs> uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, uh, let me say that um, 80 years ago is a little while, or 90 years ago is a little while for Mr. Lucas and I, but my my first question is for uh, Vice Chair Qualls. With coronavirus cases surging this fall, our economy is still in a precarious position. Moody's projects that default rates for corporations uh, could rise to as much as 15% next quarter. States and cities are facing estimated budget shortfalls of $1 trillion and New York City recently saw its debt downgraded. Uh, all of this creates the possibility that financial markets will be very volatile, and we may see a return to the disruption that we saw in the municipal bond market in March. With all of this in mind, do you believe it would be appropriate to eliminate the municipal liquidity facility 
at the end of this year? Uh, well, the the uh, the data that you provided are are clearly uh, correct, and I agree with that. We are not uh, out of the woods uh, on the uh, uh, on the restoration of the economy. Uh, the economy has been uh, coming back uh, more quickly than we expected, but the unemployment rate is still high. There's still a lot of burdens on small businesses. Uh, so we are uh, so we're looking very closely at what the uh, position ought to be with respect to all of the facilities, including the municipal facility. At the end of this year, we haven't uh, come to a decision yet. Uh, the situation continues to evolve, uh, and and uh, we'll make that decision uh, uh, towards the end of the year. But uh, uh, but we're very mindful of the facts you've cited. What about the Main Street? lending program is that is, is that in the same precarious position or with, with all, all of the facilities uh will uh expire at the end of this year uh unless extended i think that's true for all of them certainly the and um, uh and and so all of them uh we're looking at as to as to this question of whether they should be uh, extended or not uh, and very mindful of the of the current environment are small businesses out of the woods yet, or do we still have some concerns? Uh, no, I think uh, you know the there, there's uh, uh, certainly reason uh, to be concerned about the pressures on small businesses. Uh, they have uh, performed better. The stimulus that was provided in the spring, both from the Fed and from the Treasury, uh, has been longer lasting uh, than expected. But obviously, it's not going to last uh, forever. Um, uh, I think that households are probably in a better shape than small businesses as you look at uh, as you look at the uh, economic performance uh, currently. Uh, so uh, you know so uh, those again, those are issues that we're looking at. Thanks for your response. Uh, Mr. Hood, can you tell us what your agency is doing and this is a follow-up to Mr. Sherman's question. What is your agency doing to encourage? Um, your credit unions to do all that they can to help consumers and small business owners that need forbearance on their obligations. Credit unions have a long history for almost a century, Representative Clay, of helping their member owners during times of adversity. We are encouraging our credit unions to do just that. Very proud of the fact that they, to date, have already been able to provide over 1.7 million forbearances up to a total amount of $55 billion. We continue to let them also know that in addition to our encouragement to help their member owners, that they would not have any of these actions held against them when our examiners come to do their examinations in the year ahead. That gives the credit unions great certainty in knowing that they will not be penalized for taking prudent and pragmatic approaches to helping their member owners survive this challenging environment. Thank you for that response. Ms. McWilliams is uh, FDIC. Are they uh, doing anything to encourage your institutions to um, help small business owners and families with their forbearance obligations. Absolutely. We have done a number of things um, to encourage our financial institutions to work with their borrowers. And we have instructed our examiners to show utmost flexibility when they are looking at the at the books of these banks uh, for the next exam. Um, you know, we have done a number of things to make sure that the PPP loans, as we discussed earlier, get processed for small businesses. Uh, we have issued a statement on the use of alternative data, which should help small businesses that have usually trouble getting uh, traditional uh, credit reporting metrics, et cetera. And I'm happy to provide you additional information on what we have done. I, I see my time has expired, Madam Chair, and I thank the witnesses for that. Uh, thank you very much. Mr. Barr, uh, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Madam Chairwoman. Good to see all of my colleagues, and I look forward to seeing all of you all in person next week. Uh, uh, Chair McWilliams, uh, first question to you. According to a recent study from the FDIC, citizens in rural communities are much more likely than people in urban or suburban areas to visit bank branches for their financial needs. Unfortunately, those branches are becoming scarce in rural communities across the country. A recent Fed study found that a total of 794 rural counties lost a combined 1,553 bank branches uh, over the last uh, eight years, a 14% decline, and I worry that this decline has only accelerated as a result of the pandemic. 
And while more and more people nationwide are turning to online banking and mobile banking, this trend is slower among the rural population because of a diminishing uh, number of not only bank branches, but also the lack of uh, adequate broadband internet, which reduces their access to safe and reliable banking services. I've introduced bills to combat both of these issues, but the problems are exacerbated by the pandemic. So Chair McWilliams, given this data, how has the pandemic affected rural populations access to banking services compared to their urban and suburban counterparts? And what can Congress do to ensure rural populations aren't cut off from the banking system? It's an excellent question, uh, Congressman, and frankly, it's a question that we have struggled with for some time, recognizing that there is uh, rural depopulation as more of the, I would say, younger folks are moving to urban areas where there are more jobs. Um, and, and I have done extensive outreach with our rural bankers to make sure I understand what's going on in those communities. Frankly, we don't have good metrics uh, yet on uh, the impact of the pandemic on the rural bank branches and uh, banking services. We're hoping to do that post-mortem when we're past the, the, the dire straits. But I would say that I have heard anecdotally that uh, rural communities in particular have been hard hit, uh, not only by the pandemic itself, but that the shutdowns, economic shutdowns have affected them disproportionately because there is a smaller number of businesses operating on the, in those communities per capita. So when those businesses close, uh, uh, you know, fewer people are able to get the benefit of, of, of being able to visit that business and uh, of, of workforce to get paid. So I would say that anything that Congress can do to help rural communities uh, at its time of need would be would be welcome uh, at the, and in the in the banking sector in particular. Uh, we will continue monitoring where we have branch closures. We will continue thinking about innovation and how technology and innovation can serve those communities, especially in areas where there is a single bank branch or no branch at all. And we certainly think there is an opportunity to the Community Reinvestment Act to focus on these issues, um, as was done in the proposal that the FDIC joined the OCC on. Um, and certainly with broadband issues, uh, we have highlighted that uh, there should be CRA credit given for the broadband uh, access expansion in rural communities so that banks know this as well. Yeah, that's a great idea, Chair McWilliams. And um, I, I noted uh, Chairman Meek's interest in um, the de novo charter issue. I want to work with him in a bipartisan way. Maybe we can uh, combine my interest in rural banks and his interest in minority depository institutions and do some good for for all of these banking deserts. Uh, Acting Comptroller Brooks, you and I have discussed this topic at depth. I look forward to welcoming you, welcoming you to Kentucky next month to discuss access to capital in rural areas with community lenders and lenders in my district. Uh, how, how has the, the, the OCC's efforts since the onset of the pandemic, including the updated CRA, attempted to mitigate the negative impacts of COVID on rural communities? Well, uh, Congressman, thank you for the question. And as a two-time Kentucky Colonel, I'm excited to come home to the bluegrass and do that event with you. So thank you for the invitation. I, I would say there are two things uh, that we can do together on this to make an impact quickly. Uh, the first is picking up on what Chairman Williams just noted. And that is one of the main points of our CRA reform was to make lending and investment in rural communities a more attractive financial proposition for banks. And so what we did in the CRA reform that had never been done before is we allowed banks to count loans made in small family farming communities toward their CRA obligations, regardless of whether those areas were in their geographic assessment area. So all of a sudden we've used regulatory uh, power to make those loans more economically attractive to banks that have ignored those communities for far too long. And then the second thing as you and I talked about is it has simply taken too long uh, to approve any kind of bank charter over the last 10 years, whether it's um, a, a de novo in rural America, whether it's an MDI in an inner city somewhere or any other kind of bank. And so one of the things that we've done inside the OCC in the last six months is to develop a new process designed to cut the timeline for getting bank charters in half from an average of about 18 months to an average of about nine months. Once we can do that, I think you'll find that organizers of banks in small town Kentucky will have a much easier time seeing an end date for that and getting it across the line. Uh, thank you. My time has expired. I look forward to seeing you in Kentucky next month. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you. I now recognize Mr. Green for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, thank you also, Mr. Ranking Member. Um, Madam Chair, I'd like to visit with uh, Mr. Brooks for just a moment. Mr. Brooks, you have your project REACH, and within Project REACH, you have an alternative credit scoring initiative. With reference to this initiative, 
I have some information indicating that you have said that you find promise in factors such as do other people in your ecosystem or family have homes? Um, I'm curious as to how this uh, will aid a person in uh, paying bills. Could you kindly give me a response? Sure. Well, Congressman, there's nothing in Project Reach remotely about that. Um, I've been asked questions in media events about the way that artificial intelligence in the future could be used to assess people's creditworthiness. And I've speculated that there are unknown factors, uh, social factors and others that might be predictive. Uh, Project Reach has nothing to do with that. What we're looking at in Project Reach is the uh, inclusion of rent payments, utility payments and bank cash flow data as a way of including uh, people in the credit system and especially in the wealth building system where they've been excluded for years. And I would just comment that of the 45 million Americans who don't have a credit score, blacks are about 10 times as likely as whites uh, relative to their proportion of the population to not have a credit score. So we think finding a way to predict credit worthiness, particularly for African-Americans, is one of the most important things we're doing at the OCC today. Well, thank you very much. I'm, I'm pleased to have you clarify. And uh, sometimes people do make mistakes in reporting uh, on us. Uh, I have on many occasions had this to happen to me. I'm also very pleased to hear you mention rent, uh, rental payments. Uh, would you also include uh, light bills, gas bills, phone bills? All of these things, if they're paid timely, would be indicative of a person's ability to not only be responsible, but also to meet uh, obligations. Uh, your thoughts? Absolutely. I mean, I mean, listen, this is an issue I've been working on for 25 years in my career, and it's a travesty that it's taken us this long to realize that a person's payment of any recurring obligation right, is predictive of their likelihood of paying a mortgage. So we need to fix this. And I think it's easier than people thought. I think we're going to be able to fix this quicker than people would believe. Well, my hope is that you'll, uh, you'll get it repaired uh, as quickly as possible, um, since you seem to have a good sense of what it's all about. I appreciate it greatly. I have a piece of legislation, H.R. 123. It is styled Alternative uh, Data for Additional Credit FHA Pilot Program. And uh, I'd like to commend it to you. Um, I'd like to get this to you for your perusal because I'm interested in uh, your input. Um, would uh, you uh, allow me to do so? And uh, I'll see if I can get the appropriate person on your team to uh, get this to you. Congressman, I wish you would, and I'd love to talk to you about that personally when you have an opportunity. I, I promise you we'll, we'll have that uh, conversation, and uh, it means a lot to me. Now, uh, let me go on to uh, the uh, MBIs, the Minority Depository Institutions, if I may. Uh, I, um, I make it my business to try to understand what's happening with them. And a lot of what's happening with them is uh, the lack of capital. It's true. But also... Uh, they have very small staff. And uh, th when the OCC comes in to uh, do what you normally do in terms of testing, and that, uh, it takes up a lot of the time that they have. I'm really interested in finding out how can we streamline this process so that it doesn't take up all of the time of the few people that they have who are having a hands-on experience with making the loans uh, so that they can stay in business while you're there uh, doing what you do uh, as a regulator? Well, th this is a real conundrum, and I think there are two or three different prongs to the solution. So the first is, let's just talk about their small staffs for a moment. That is absolutely one of the reasons that MDIs fail at a rate far exceeding uh, the rate of normal banks. And that's why in our, in our MDI component of Project Reach, one of the issues we've asked big banks to pledge as part of their participation is not only that they'll fund capital inside of these institutions, but that they will also do management rotations and exchange programs so that big banks can second some of their employees to work inside of MDIs, not only so they can learn about MDIs, but so they can provide boots on the ground in a way that they don't have today. That's a critical component of success. The second thing has to do with, it is far too hard for banks and especially small banks to onboard technology solutions to outsource some of the functions that they now do manually. We've seen this as an issue in our vendor management guidance where it takes forever for banks to do that. So we'll make that easier as well. My time is up. I have another question, but Madam Chair, I do thank you for your kindness and I yield back. You're very welcome. Uh, Mr. Cleaver, you're recognized for five minutes. I'm sorry, excuse me, Mr. Cleaver. Um, Mr. Hill, 
Mr. Hill is recognized for five minutes and you're next. Mr. Hill. Thank you, Madam Chair. My best wishes to all my colleagues. Look forward to being with you next week. And thanks to this uh, for this excellent panel uh, on a very timely set of topics. Uh, Mr. Quarles, let me start with you and uh, talk about central bank digital currency, not something in your bailiwick per se, but very important to financial services and the regulated side of our sector, as well as uh, our economy and American competitiveness. Dr. Bill Foster and I wrote uh, Chairman Powell back in 2019 about, is the Fed considering a digital dollar? And we got a note back from Chairman Powell about a month later saying, not really. But since that time, uh, Governor Brainerd and others have become very active in thinking through the idea of a digital dollar. And of course, your colleagues around the world are heavily focused on this. Could you give us an update of what changed? Why is the Fed now focused that a digital dollar is an important priority for the central bank? Well, I, I, I think it would be accurate to say that uh, understanding uh, the implications of central bank digital currency is something that we've always been uh, focused on. Uh, it's fair to say that that uh, focus has increased over the course of the last year. It's increased uh, internationally. I think we've seen uh, with some of the uh, proposals from a variety of quarters uh, for uh, uh, different types of payment systems um, uh, that have raised uh, some uh, regulatory and supervisory issues uh, internationally, that that has put a premium on uh, it, on our uh, tending to our own payment system uh, and a, a central bank digital currency uh, could be a part of that solution. So we are actively engaged in understanding this. I still think it would be premature uh, to say uh, that uh, uh, that you know that that we believe that we believe that this is a solution uh, that the United States would need to implement. We are doing a lot of research. We're weighing the pros and cons. Uh, we have pilot projects in place. Uh, and, and the international study of this is picking up as well. The FSB will also be uh, uh, looking at this. Um, but uh, this is still in the early stages. Um, it's a very important issue. Uh, uh, but I wouldn't say yet that we have uh, changed our stance and now believe that it's something that the United States needs. And it's a question. Well, uh, I certainly agree it's not uh, imminent, but it's certainly a matter of national security as the world's reserve currency that we consider it. And uh, I commend you to the work uh, that uh, your team is doing with MIT. I think that kind of research is important. But I do believe that this is a critical element for American competitiveness in the years ahead. And I want to urge on uh, the work of the Fed's team. Let me switch uh, gears to uh, my friend from Missouri, Lacey Clay's line of questioning about the 13-3 facilities and the use of uh, the Treasury Exchange Stabilization Fund. Do you, uh, I heard your answer, but I just wanna be clear. I'm gonna ask it a different way. <clears throat> Will the Board of Governors uh, and the Treasury Secretary ask Congress uh, by some date here, just in the next few days uh, to, uh, ask for legislative authority to uh, extend the CARES Act uh, exchange stabilization funding? Uh, so that is um, th th that is not something uh, that we have decided yet, but that we are considering actively the pros and cons of that. Do you think that those facilities, do you think the, <coughs> excuse me, that the Fed and the Treasury have adequate resources since the economy is reopening and there's been very little significant uptake since the height of the crisis back in March on those facilities. Do you think you have a sufficient resources under existing 13-3 powers and the Fed with their existing non-CARES exchange stabilization fund? Do you think that could be sufficient as you look at uh, 2021? Uh, well, so we don't need new congressional authority to extend the facilities. Uh, it's an existing law that we can extend them. Uh, and I'm sure you you are all aware that there are significant unused uh, resources currently uh, for the facilities. They have uh, they served a very useful purpose, but principally as a backstop to private uh, sector activity. Um, 
Uh, but it really would be, I think, a, uh, a decision for Congress whether, uh, uh, whether those amounts should be supplemented. I look forward to following up with you on this. Thanks for your time. Appreciate the panel. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yield back. Thank you. And um, now I will recognize Mr. Cleaver uh, for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, uh, I'd like to just uh, say how pleased uh, I am uh, that you will be um, the, the chair of this committee uh, for uh, another 10 years. But um, let, let me uh, go on and, and uh, follow through uh, on some questions that uh, actually Mr. Clay and Mr. Uh, I think Mr. Green already spoke of. Uh, but uh, Ms. Mac Williams, you know, um, but thank you for your willingness to serve our country first and foremost. Um, and uh, you know, some of some of you will be going on uh, after January uh, twenty uh, in in your positions. Uh, there's some some overlap, uh, and you you are one, Miss McWilliams. Uh, and and uh, before I left my apartment here in Washington this morning, uh, we looked at the cases of COVID around the country. And I looked at the Midwest where I live in, in uh, Kansas City, uh, Missouri, and uh, Missouri and Kansas are both blood red uh, in terms of the new cases. It's frightening. Uh, I've just been meeting with our hospitals trying to figure out if we needed to try to, to uh, prepare for a uh, field uh, hospital in, in our city. Uh, so it's a, it's a big issue. And, uh, you know, we had... Um, uh, we had over 700,000 people uh, who uh, filed for unemployment. And uh, based on uh, conversations with Fed officials, uh, I understand that unemployment declines may represent people uh, completely dropping out of the workforce. So uh, when you consider all these things and how we need to have a, a, a strong uh, fight against COVID and trying to also re recover the economy. Uh, are, are you involved in any way at this point uh, in uh, some kind of uh, engagement with the Biden Harris transition team uh, so that uh, FDIC can play its historic role, have it continue without any disruption? Uh, Congressman Cleaver, thank you for your kind words, and um, I, uh, I, I'm grateful for your service as well, and I look forward to seeing you in the next Congress. But um, I will say that, uh, you know, we have abided by all of the requirements of, of government agencies that are imposed on us, and we have certainly engaged to the extent uh, that, that's, you know, feasible and possible with uh, you know, planning, et cetera, for, uh, for the new administration starting in January. Uh, we have not, I don't, to my understanding, I have not had any uh, discussions with the Biden transition team. Okay. Um, some, I'm troubled by the fact that, that, I mean, we need to have a seamless uh, move uh, in, in, uh, in, the, in some of these important areas. And of course, you, you, you know, uh, running the FDIC, uh, is one of those uh, critically important uh, institutions, and so uh, well, let me let me ask you. So, are you are you preparing for a transition in terms of being able to present uh, the, the the new administration with uh, information uh, that would allow for this seamless uh, uh, transition that I, I think all Americans, regardless of their political stripe, would, would like to see. I mean, I, 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 I don't want you to ignore uh, the, the, I mean, I, uh, I'm, I'm a little frustrated because I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure I understood what you just said. Uh, it, you know, are you preparing for the transition? Let me just ask you that. Well, I can assure you, Congressman, that uh, any transition to the new administration is going to be seamless. None of our critical functions are going to be affected. We stand ready to work with whoever is in the White House come January. And uh, you have my commitment that I will work with uh, whoever is on my board. Uh, and, I tr and, I, and I intend, um, I will even share this with you, I intend to fulfill the remainder of my term. Oh, okay. I, I'm not sure. Yes, okay. Um, but let me let me move on, uh, uh, Mr. Quarles. Uh, let me follow up on something that uh, my uh, 
longtime friend, uh, colleague, uh, who I will miss dearly, uh, Lacey Clay, uh, with issues that he, he raised uh, earlier uh, about, uh, you know, expanding the lending programs uh, uh, for the Federal Reserve and, and uh, Treasury. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm a former mayor, and so I've always looked, oh my goodness, I guess my time is up. I'm sorry. Thank you, Madam Chair. When my time expired. I heard the beep, so. Yes, your time has expired, Mr. Cleaver. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Immer, you are now recognized for five minutes. Is Mr. Emmer available? If not, we will go to Mr. Laudermilk of Georgia for five minutes. You recognize Mr. Laudermilk? I'm sorry. Is Mr. Laudermilk on the platform? If not, we will go to Mr. Mooney for five minutes. If not, we will go to Mr. Davidson for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. And I thank uh, our guests for uh, your, your work in this uh, tough field. Uh, and really a period that has seen some important steps by the people represented here today. Um, so, uh, you know, without spending much time, I, I want to get to as many as I can. But uh, Acting Comptroller Brooks, I want to commend you for the work you've done promoting innovation at the OCC, particularly within the digital asset space. Uh, I'm particularly encouraged by the OCC's July interpretive letter re related to uh, banks being able to provide custody services for digital assets, especially uh, focused on holding the unique cryptographic keys. I appreciate the approach, and it echoes custody language in my bipartisan bill, the Token Taxonomy Act. Action by the OCC was much needed, especially as states such as Wyoming have already provided legal clarity for example, with a special purpose charter for Kraken Financial. My main concern within this space is that we do not have sufficient legislative clarity and regulatory clarity that will enable digital assets to truly be adopted uh, and to provide the safeguards that uh, markets and consumers and investors need. Do you believe that uh, digital assets could benefit from the certainty that comes from legislation signed into law in particular could you address this res with respect to the custody issue? Well, uh, first of all, Congressman, thank you for the question. And I've always appreciated your deep engagement in these issues going back you know, many years together. Uh, what I would tell you is on the custody side, I think that um, uh, clarity around what constitutes a qualified custodian and what assets are permitted to be custodied would be a good thing. And I think as you noted in your uh, Token Taxonomy Act and is in some companion legislation kicking around has also recognized there is a lack of securities law clarity that, uh, that needs legislation. At the same time, uh, what we have concluded at the OCC, and this is work that began long before I got here, is that uh, digital assets are analogous to other kinds of assets that have entered the system over the years and that the banking system normally has been the vehicle for transmitting that stuff across the, the system. And so picking up on a discussion that Congressman Hill and uh, Vice Chair Quarles had just a few minutes ago, you know, our basic view is that blockchains are essentially private payment networks. Uh, there are other private payment networks in the world, like the ACH system. Uh, that's a private payment network. It's just owned by a very small number of big banks, and it's only open to banks, versus blockchains are payment systems that anybody can join, right? They're uh, open for everyone. They're free and equal to everyone, and in that sense, may be superior in other ways to existing networks. That's really what our work in this space is about, is the recognition that what crypto and blockchain are fundamentally about is changing the way that people interact with each other in the world of finance in the same way that the Internet changed the way that people interact with each other for, for, uh, for Internet information. And so I thank you for your leadership on that. I think that securities clarity and custody clarity would be great. 
as a as an act of Congress, but I also think that the OCC has a fair amount of existing statutory authority to clarify banks' role in that overall part of the financial ecosystem. I, I agree with your viewpoint, and thanks for thanks for really uh, clarifying what you're doing and how you view it. Uh, I hope uh, my colleagues will take note. There really is uh, underlying support for this that is not partisan, and I'm encouraged uh, by the recent recent uh, some of the hearings that we've had in the fintech task force so i hope we can continue that progress and and maybe even codify some of this into law and as you alluded to uh, securities law there's a certainty that's desperately needed there and, and frankly sometimes i feel like the sec is wandering further off course uh, hopefully uh, hester Peer, hester purse will continue to be a voice of reason and people will listen to her uh, going more more clearly going forward so thanks for that. Uh, I, I do have to move on to a couple other topics, but um, you know, recently launched the Sound Money Caucus with uh, some colleagues, and you know, we're at a period where um, you know we're printing money. We're not really borrowing it truly. I mean, we owe it. It's it's borrowed in that sense. We uh, we it counts as debt, um, but inherently that dilutes the value of all the other money. Uh, so, Vice Chair Quarles, what's your level of concern about the long-term consequences for America's debt and in a related topic, you know, the size of the Fed's balance sheet? Uh, how will we know when we've crossed a limit where we could really undermine uh, the essential liquidity that was able to be provided? Uh, we provided some stability. These are all good things. But in the long run, um, you know, is there a level of debt that would be concerning for you? Uh, well, I, I, I think uh, history would show uh, that uh, for any country, uh, there's a level of debt that should be concerning. The United States is uh, uh, in a special position uh, given our wealth and uh, our status as a reserve currency. So I don't think that's upon us uh, soon, but that is definitely something uh, that as we look at the overall uh, economic and financial situation uh, uh, that we face, we yeah, well, you know, thanks. And it, it's hard to state specifically, but, but you know, the, the consequence of some of the growth of the Fed's balance sheet is a related way. It's been, uh, you know, was a lifeline, I think, will, will be a case study for years on the value of a central bank uh, in a time of crisis, the last part of March. Um, but there are a lot of regulatory policies that are having some real economic distortion. And I look forward to working with you and others there. Thanks for your work and uh, wish we had more time to collaborate. Uh, and I yield. I think I'm up, but I got to get recognized first. Without objection? Uh, okay, I'll begin. Thank you, Mr. Davidson. Um, to our panel, thank you very much uh, for your service uh, in this difficult uh, moment in American history. Uh, I think that the banking system and the financial system has proven itself strong, uh, but I would just uh, uh, state to everybody, we're not out of this. and. In Colorado, uh, just as uh, in Kansas, uh, we've seen a terrible spike uh, in the infection. Uh, a month ago, we were less than one in a thousand had the infection. Uh, now, two weeks ago, we were at less than one in 300. Last week, one in 200. Uh, Madam Chair, I went ahead and started, if that's okay with you. Yeah, uh, yeah that, that's cool. We had a little technical difficulty. Thank you for getting started. Go right ahead. You have five okay. minutes. All right. And so the infection rate now is less than one in 100 in Colorado. Our hospitalizations are higher than they've been at any time uh, since the beginning of this. And we had a uh, terrible hospitalization rate uh, back in March and April. Our death rate is starting to rise again. And we thought we had this in hand. And uh, this virus is a, a very nefarious, insidious thing. And so to the regulators and to my colleagues, I'd say we're not out of this. And uh, as strong as it's been, I think that uh, this pandemic uh, is not over and it will have a long tail. And so to the panelists, 
Uh, first, uh, Madam Chair, I'd like to offer a letter uh, from the Mortgage Bankers Association and other industry partners uh, to be submitted uh, to the record. Without objection, such is the order. Thank you. So one of the things that Mr. Luchtemeyer and a number of uh, my colleagues have mentioned is that we took certain steps in the CARES Act to make sure that there could be flexibility from the regulators to the banks, from the banks to the borrowers, you know, the landlords, for instance, from the landlords to the tenants. And I think that flexibility is going to have to uh, remain in place. And for instance, um, we limited uh, the troubled debt uh, restructuring kinds of uh, assets uh, to six months for modified loans and only through the end of the year. So I would ask all the panelists, do any of you plan to update this guidance to allow these COVID loan modifications to ex extend beyond six months and extend well into next year, uh, given this, uh, the state of the pandemic? And I'd start with you, uh, Chair McWilliams. Certainly, and thank you for that question. We have worked hard to reach compromise with the Financial Accounting Standards Board. And I would say um, we are willing to do, and, and I can't speak for others, but I'll say I'm willing to do what it takes to make sure that our banks can continue to be strong and resilient and that homeowners and small businesses can continue to have access to credit and stay in their homes and operate their businesses. Um, as with many, many other things, it takes two to, to tango. And in this case, it takes uh, it takes a village of us. Uh, so you only have a part of that of that village here on, on, on this panel. Uh, you know, we would have to work with uh, Financial Accounting Standards Board, FASB, to make sure that they also are willing to uh, accommodate uh, the extension of what we have agreed to back in March. Uh, thank you. Mr. Mr. Comptroller, how about you? <clears throat> well, Congressman, uh, thanks for the question. I, I echo what Chairman McWilliams says, and I guess I would go a little bit further and say that I think that accounting treatment is just one part of the puzzle for banks. So, you know, in, in our world, one of the most important exposures is on the residential mortgage side. And the large banks that I've spoken to uh, specifically about how they're doing loan modifications and forbearances tell me that they learned a lot um, from the HAMP program coming out of the financial crisis. And they understand that even irrespective of accounting treatment, it's better to maximize the net present value of these loans by keeping existing borrowers in those loans as long as there is a future ability to repay. So I think that there's a commitment on the part of both banks and regulators to working there. Um, but on the technical issue of TDRs, there is some work to do with FASB. I agree with All right, that. So while we're on that subject, in um, the HEROES Act that we proposed, we had some substantial housing assistance uh, pieces in there. Uh, my concern is, and I'd ask how you look at this from a regulatory standpoint, uh, we've got forbearances or we've got moratoria on evictions, but then these tenants are going to have to come up with several months worth of rent. I mean, how do you analyze that? Do you think they're going to be able to do that without assistance from us, the United States? Yeah, uh, Congressman, I would say rent is a little bit more complex than mortgage. I think the good news is in the CARES Act, it was fairly clear on the mortgage side that when a borrower comes out from forbearance, the loan is contractually current on the first day out of forbearance. Yeah, but but let me stop you. But the landlord is eventually going to have to pay the bank and you're eventually going to have to analyze that bank. Yeah, that, that's, that's my point is rent is more complicated. And I think it's worth uh, looking at it legislatively, as you say. OK, thank you. And thanks, Madam Chair, for the time. You. Mr. Emmer, you are now recognized for five minutes. Madam Chair, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Awesome. That's great. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, for hosting this important hearing during this uh, uncertain time. As we close out the 116th Congress, we have a lot to be thankful for because of the nonpartisan efforts to educate and inform members on the financial technology issues on the FinTech Task Force. I want to take a moment to thank Representative Lynch for his efforts to lead the task force. As we've seen over the past two years, fintech issues are only rising to higher prominence. It's my hope that next Congress, we continue that nonpartisan dedication to fintech issues, whether that be on the task force or an even stronger focus on the issues through perhaps a subcommittee. One thing is for sure, the opportunities that fintech innovations present for all Americans and indeed the entire world are not going away. Thank you to both sides of the aisle for their ongoing focus on these issues. And 
Thank you also to Vice Chairman Quarles, Chairman McWilliams, Chairman Hood, and Acting Comptroller Brooks for all of your work over the past couple of years. In particular, Mr. Brooks and Chairman McWilliams, you have both demonstrated a strong commitment to crafting a regulatory environment that encourages innovation and growth in the fintech space. As we know, with more competition, products, and services in banking, the American people are afforded with more choice, fairer prices, and control over their financial future. Chairman McWilliams, thank you for dedicating resources to developing a financial technology strategy that works, that works with industry to craft smart and considerate regulations for fin financial technology, allowing more consumers to access the banking system. And Mr. Brooks, thank you for providing the necessary certainty for banks to provide custody of cryptocurrency assets and all you have done to ensure that the federal government remains supportive of new technologies and capable of adapting regulations to suit our country's continuing investments in innovation. I'm hopeful that additional regulators will come on board and provide uh, support for these technologies. Uh, Vice Chairman Quarles, Chairman Powell informed us in a previous committee hearing that private sector individuals and innovations may not have a place in the Fed's consideration of a digital dollar. This is concerning. So far, private actors have been responsible for the entirety of these uh, innovations and are advancing implementation of these technologies with or without the Fed. I urge the Fed to take additional efforts to make public their considerations regarding the digital dollar and to involve private sector innovators to craft a digital dollar that is sound, safe, and protective of individual privacy. Uh, why don't I start acting Comptroller Brooks? During your short but impactful tenure at the OCC, you made extraordinary inroads into providing guidance necessary for OCC regulated financial institutions to engage with digital assets such as Bitcoin and stablecoins. What difficulties or obstacles do you encounter when promoting regulatory or supervisory guidance related to digital assets to OCC regulated financial institutions? And how can that be improved? Uh, and I guess when you're done answering that, uh, I've got a couple more for you. <clears throat> well, I mean, uh, Congressman, first of all, thanks so much. And thanks so much for your partnership on this over the years. Uh, I, I really do appreciate your vision and it's great to be part of this team. What I'll tell you is on the on the institution side, there are very few impediments. You, you see that very, very shortly after we gave our uh, guidance on crypto custody, that the nation's largest bank, JP Morgan, announced it's going to launch a crypto custody business in partnership with Fidelity Digital Assets, which is the crypto arm of Fidelity Investments, a company that we're all familiar with. This recognizes the fact that somewhere between 50 and 60 million Americans own this stuff. And some of us might be excited about it and some of us might be less excited about it. But the point is a gigantic proportion of our society believes it is the future for various reasons. That part is important. I think the other thing that's a bit of a challenge is as a country, we haven't yet recognized the important competitiveness aspect of this. So when you see that China has already issued the e-remnant so China has adopted a digital currency of their national fiat currency that is now transacting on a blockchain. And in this country, we're still years away from a national real-time payment system. I come to the conclusion that you come to, which is the best solution is to win the way America has always won, which is by unleashing the power of our innovative, dynamic, risk-taking private sector. We have built private stable coins in this country that already have a market cap in the tens of billions of dollars. These things are transacting daily, they are growing rapidly, and they're used for broad commercial purposes. I don't think in this country we need to wait to build a command and control government solution. I think the private sector is on it. And I think the role of the regulators on this panel is to provide a framework to make sure there aren't bank runs or other problems that consumers would be affected by. I'm sorry for eating up your time. <laughs> That's all right. Thank you. I look forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you, Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair. Mr. Himes, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and a hearty welcome back to uh, to my colleagues on the committee. Look forward to working with you, and uh, welcome to all of our regulators. Um, it's good to see you, too. Um, I uh, cut my teeth in the Congress starting in 2009 when we were experiencing a just brutal meltdown of another type, very different, of course, than what we've seen today. Um, but I think what we're seeing today, the economic effects of a pandemic and the economic shutdown, therefore, uh, indicated um, is not something we would have predicted. Uh, and credit where credit is due. 
Um, I appreciate the uh, actions that you have taken, especially uh, the Federal Reserve working with Treasury with the authorities granted to it by the Congress under the CARES Act. Um, my hope is that this was handled uh, well. Uh, credit where credit is due to the Dodd-Frank Act, too. Uh, I was a freshman when we crafted that legislation, and uh, when it was done, it was appreciated by pretty much nobody on the left or the right. But here we are, uh, where the dog that didn't bark, of course, was a major dislocation in our financial system, despite the dramatic dislocation in our economy. So, Mr. Quarles, my questions are to you, uh, and hopefully I'll, hopefully I'll give you enough time to do that. Um, obviously, um, the crisis has uh, uncovered a number of things that are concerning, um, and I'd like to, if you would, if you would just address each one, uh, and obviously you won't be able to do so comprehensively, but if you could try. Number one, the dislocation in the Treasury market in mid-March uh, gave an awful lot of us heartburn. Um, number two, uh, your, a number of you have mentioned concern with the commercial credit market. Could this be something that at the end of the day causes a significant problem within the banks? And then if COVID has done one thing, it has really uncovered the disparities um, that exist in our society. And while I've heard a lot of back and forth, I actually haven't heard the regulators offer suggestions on how we might increase the bank's population uh, and make credit available to more Americans. I know that's a tall order, Mr. Quarles, but uh, you've got the remainder of my time to address those three issues. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, uh, thanks for that. And so uh, uh, I will be brief. Uh, I could take the remainder of the hearing on those three issues. But uh, uh, so on the Treasury market, uh, uh, there clearly uh, was dysfunction uh, in March. Uh, it was severe dysfunction uh, for a few days. Uh, that was caused by the uh, treasury market trading infrastructure essentially being overwhelmed by uh, by uh, sales orders on the parts of many different uh, participants. You had asset managers, you had banks, uh, you had uh, you know a, a variety of people who were looking for uh, cash liquidity uh, uh, given the severe uncertainty that there was in the middle of March. Uh, and and that overwhelmed the infrastructure of the system's uh, ability to handle that. Uh, we're looking uh, currently in a variety of uh, factors. It's, we're working multilaterally uh, with other domestic agencies. Uh, we're working internationally because this was a problem inter internationally. One of the significant um, uh, one of the significant issues uh, were, were foreign uh, sellers selling uh, in order to. Uh, get dollars for their dollar needs uh, in this time of, in this dash for cash. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I think that there are, uh, I, I think there are things that we'll need to look at uh, about the structure of the treasury market uh, in order to improve, improve its uh, operation under stress. It would be uh, premature to say what they would be. Uh, uh, the commercial credit market, uh, would there, uh, you know, given the nature of this uh, stress, uh, you know, the, the, an element of the solution has been increasing uh, debt uh, on the parts of uh, uh, many companies uh, that had uh, severe revenue restrictions uh, in the spring. Uh, that, it, you know, the, the, the corporate sector was already uh, reasonably highly indebted going into this. Uh, and so that's something we need to look at. We're running a bank stress test currently uh, to see how we think that that could roll up into the financial uh, system. Those will be very granularly run and we'll release in the middle of December results uh, for each bank, public results uh, how they perform uh, in this that I think will give us more clarity into that issue. Uh, on disparities, uh, just to, um, uh, uh, to be very uh, quick, I think that the, uh, A, the actions that we uh, have taken uh, at the Fed uh, to improve the uh, a, a more rapid return uh, to uh, to economic health, uh, which we and we aren't there yet. Obviously, uh, we've learned at the Fed over the course of the last few years uh, that when we when we allow the economy and particularly allow the unemployment rate to fall faster uh, and to fall farther than the Fed has been comfortable allowing it in the past. Uh, that that benefits particularly those who are most disadvantaged uh, in uh, in society, and that's something that we can do. The Fed doesn't have a lot of distributive tools, uh, but we've seen that there are distributive effects to that uh, that are Im important, and that was one of the reasons why we changed our framework 
uh, uh, as we did uh, recently announced. Thank, Thank you. you. Time Mr. Laudermill, you're recognized for five minutes. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate the opportunity to be online uh, with you here today. And Vice Chairman Corals, let me first thank you for aligning the Fed's supervision with the tailoring regime by applying LISIC only to Category 1 firms and moving smaller and less risky firms into the large and foreign banking organizations supervision portfolio. I think this rightly refocuses the uh, LISIC supervisory portfolio by recognizing the substantially reduced size and risk of Category 3 firms and does not change the capital or liquidity requirements for firms not in the LISIC portfolio. We really appreciate your efforts there. On another topic, lenders did an outstanding job of issuing PPP loans to, small, uh, to support small businesses and their employees, but PPP loans remain an asset on lenders' balance sheets until the loans are forgiven, and forgiveness is taking longer than we all expected. That means a number of financial institutions are on the verge of crossing an asset-based regulatory threshold because of PPP loans, which are guaranteed by the SBA and are designed to have a zero credit risk for the lender. I recently sent a letter with 13, 13 of my colleagues on this committee asking you all to address this issue. I also introduced a bipartisan bill with Congressman David Scott that would exclude PPP loans from asset-based regulatory thresholds of $10 billion and under. Madam Chair, thank you for including the bill in our discussions during this hearing today. Uh, Chairman McWilliams, I appreciate that the FDIC has addressed the 500 million and 1 billion asset thresholds, and I hope you can address the others. Uh, Chairman Hood, thank you for addressing this issue for credit unions. The uh, questions, um, Acting Controller uh, Brooks, I understand the banking agencies are discussing how to proceed with this on an interagency basis. Can you share? Uh, what you were planning. Uh, yeah, yes, Congressman, and thank you for the question. Um, we're not final on this yet, but I can definitely give you some parameters of what's being discussed amongst us. Um, the idea is there are, first of all, the need to identify each of the asset thresholds that trips you into a new regulatory regime, and there are many of them, this being the government. So there's a threshold at 500 million, a threshold at 600 million, a threshold at a billion, and 2.5 billion, and 10 billion, et cetera. So the basic parameters I believe are that for a period of one year, which could of course be extended by the agencies, but you know, to Chairman, uh, Vice Chair Quarles point earlier, we wanna get to normal as soon as we can get to normal. <clears throat> so for a period of one year, we would exclude PPP assets from each of those asset thresholds up to and including the $10 billion threshold, but not above that. Our theory is that we wanna do surgery here. We don't wanna act with a meat cleaver. We wanna be very careful and we don't wanna dislocate the agency's ability to manage risk but I think that we'll settle out somewhere pretty close to that. Okay, we appreciate your efforts. And if you could, please keep us updated as, as you move forward, because you're right, there is a myriad of, of regulations and uh, tripwires along the way. Uh, Vice Chairman Coros, does the, the Fed, Federal Reserve plan to address these regulatory thresholds? Uh, yes, there's an active, uh, we're, we're obviously engaged in very active interagency discussions, uh, and I would uh, subscribe uh, to what uh, Controller Brooks, uh, what Controller Brooks said, and I think we'll have something uh, to report pretty quickly, actually. Okay, I appreciate that, um, because a lot of the small banks are really uh, hanging out there. We actually have a bank in our district, has two branches, small bank issued more PPP loans than uh, one of the largest banks in the nation did nationwide. And so uh, you can see how that could really negatively affect uh, this this bank that stepped up, it's Vinings Bank, they stepped up and they took on a lot because they are a community bank and their community was uh, riding uh, on the, the needs of, of having these PPP loans. And uh, my final uh, question is, uh, Chairman McWilliams, do you anticipate that the FDIC will provide additional relief as well? Yes, and we are, um, so we have already excluded PPP loans from um, the, the deposit assessments for banks, but we are now working with the other regulators, as mentioned, uh, to make sure that um, we, to the extent that we don't have the clear statutory authority to change thresholds, uh, to maybe um, a, a freeze the, the, the total consolidated assets as a prior date for those thresholds. So we're trying to be, um, I would say, as flexible as possible to make sure that banks have a, a venue to, to proceed with uh, helping stimulate the economy and make sure that borrowers can stay in their homes. Well, thank you very much. 
as I mentioned, this is this has been a, a collaborative effort between the private industry and and government as well, and so we need to make sure that we're covering them as as well. And so, Madam Chair, that's all the questions I have. I know it's an unusual uh, moment for me to yield back remaining time. Well, thank you. I appreciate it, Mr. Foster. You are recognized for five minutes. Thank you. And I'm audible and visible here. Yes. Oh, great. All right. Well, thank you, Madam Chair, and to our witnesses. And I'd like to get started by just seconding the comments of my colleague, French Hill, regarding central bank digital currencies. Now, uh, Vice Chair Quarles, uh, you just spoke and have spoken before about the dysfunction that occurred in our treasury bond markets in March, and noted that the sheer volume of in that market may have, quote, outpaced the ability of the private market infrastructure to support stress of any sort there. Uh, under normal circumstances, the treasury market is the deepest and most liquid fixed income market in the world. It serves as a critical benchmark for the mortgage, corporate loan, and muni bond markets that are essential to the flow of credit in our economy. And it allows the US dollar to operate as the world's dominant reserve currency. And that's why it's crucial that, that these financial pipes continue to function well, even in stressed and volatile conditions and especially as we continue to fight COVID-19 and work to provide fiscal relief to millions of struggling families and small businesses. Now, when the Fed has to step in to support the markets for treasury bonds, I view it as sort of the financial equivalent of our military going to DEFCON 2. And when that happens, it is our duty in Congress to see what sort of technical changes could prevent this in the future. One straightforward solution to this issue would be a, a simple requirement that all secondary market treasury transactions be subject to central clearing. Uh, today, uh, participants in the markets for treasuries face a, a centrally cleared counterparty in less than a quarter of all transactions. Uh, by comparison, because of the Dodd-Frank Act, central clearing covers virtually 100% of the exchange traded derivatives and equities and a majority of the swap market transactions. And despite a fair amount of, of squealing at the time, I believe that this is now widely viewed as one of the many successful reforms of Dodd-Frank. So Vice Chair Quarles, could you explain to us your view of why requiring central clearing of treasuries might be beneficial to market functioning? And what are the drawbacks and trade-offs, uh, if any, of this approach? Uh, uh, so um, uh, as, as we look at the uh, lessons uh, from the Treasury market in March. Uh, we have been uh, looking closely at this issue of uh, uh, central clearing of treasuries. Uh, the advantage uh, would be uh, that that central clearing would reduce pressure on dealer balance sheets. The current system uh, requires uh, uh, the dealers to basically uh, take those treasuries onto their balance sheets. And when there isn't another side uh, to the uh, uh, to the trade, that's obviously a uh, significant strain. Uh, the cons are are really the the cons of, of any CCP. Concentrating risk, ease. It's a complex risk management problem, uh, and and so we want to think that through carefully for a market that is as large uh, and as central uh, as you've uh, correctly identified the treasury market as being. Um, uh, you know, they're, they're, the, the pros are attractive. We're looking through this uh, carefully uh, with an interagency group. Um, I would say, uh, uh, just a, as an additional thought though, uh, that could lead to improved treasury market functioning generally. Uh, what we saw in March though, was simply that everyone was selling and no one was buying. Uh, and for, you know, there was a period uh, of a few days when there just wasn't another side to the transaction. And, and so a smoother uh, mechanism for matching buyers and sellers probably would not have addressed the March issue because the question was that there just wasn't a, a, a buyer. But that doesn't mean that it's not a, a useful wake-up call for thinking about the structure of the treasury market in that particular situation. Yeah, so you anticipate for situations like that, there is no substitute for having the Federal Reserve have some pathway in uh, to support things? And, and is there a merit if we have to go down that road to actually have a legislative clarity on the circumstances and making sure that the taxpayer is never on the hook uh, in that sort of intervention? Uh, so um, uh, so uh, situations like that, let's, 
hope uh, that uh, situations like that are as rare as this one was, uh, which is, uh, uh, you know, which is uh, once in a, a century, if not longer. Um, I think the Fed has the authority uh, to do what it is that we need here, um, uh, uh, and that uh, and, and that our, our strong exp and reasonable expectation is is that something like this is going to be uh, not repeated in our lifetimes. Well, my my goal is to die before uh, we ever have a crisis like we've been going through. Um, so thank you, and my time is up, and yield back. Thank you very much. Mr. Mooney, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Uh, so for direct questions for Vice Chairman Quarles, um, let me just start by saying the uh, well, the, 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 you know, the, the insurance insurance is normally state run. And so Vice Chairman Quarles, under the oversight of the Financial Stability Board, uh, they've adopted a holistic framework to identify and proactively address systematic risk in the global insurance market. Can you explain how the U.S. insurance regulatory regime has performed in minimizing systemic risk and more specifically how this performance compares to other regulatory systems for insurance around the world? Uh, well, I, I think we've seen uh, in the in the current stress, uh, which has uh, been severe, that the insurance industry, uh, which is regulated uh, by the states in the United States and and has been uh, since the McCarran Ferguson Act, um, uh, is you know uh, the insurance industry has performed uh, quite well, uh, and in general over. Uh, over the history uh, of our industry compared to uh, industries abroad and other forms of regulation, uh, I think that that uh, regulatory system uh, ha has stood up well. It's passed the, the practical test of what works. Um, as we look at um, uh, as, as we look at insurance regulatory reform more broadly, which the IAIS, which is a member uh, of the FSB, uh, is considering, uh, in the United States, uh, the so-called Team uh, uh, US, uh, which is the Fed and the, uh, and the NAIC uh, and the Treasury, uh, have uh, worked to ensure and have been successful in ensuring that there is scope in that process for the US uh, system to be recognized internationally. And I expect we'll be successful in the process uh, comes to completion several years from now. Well, that kind of leads to my follow-up question, and I agree with you first off that it's worked well and the state's regulating it and we've worked well, better comparable to other countries. But given that our insurance, given that our US insurance regulatory system produces comparable results to foreign frameworks, how is the Federal Reserve planning to make the case that the American system is quote, outcome equivalent, close quote, with the IAIS insurance capital standard? So, um, you know, that w there's a, a, a monitoring process that's going on at the IAIS of, of uh, their uh, uh, proposed global standard. We've created space uh, in that standard for, uh, for the U.S. Uh, framework uh, to be viewed as equivalent, as a solution that, uh, that works within the IAIS uh, project. Um, uh, that you know, monitoring process has uh, a, a fair ways to run yet. Uh, it'll be important, it'll be incumbent on us in the United States uh, to put forward a well-articulated uh, framework for how a, a, uh, a global consolidated uh, uh, insurance regulatory framework could work. The Fed has done its piece with respect to our building block approach uh, for how insurance companies that uh, uh, include a uh, in, include a depository institution can be regulated. The NAIC is working hard on its group capital approach. Uh, and again, I'm pretty confident that as we put those forward in the international discussions, uh, the equivalent will be viewed uh, uh, positively, and that the effort will be successful. Well, thank you, Vice Chair. And let me just close. I don't know how much time I have left. Let me just close by saying, as we discussed here in the United States, insurance 
has been regu regulated primarily at the state level for over a century. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. We have a system that works well here. The needs of West Virginia are different than Massachusetts and California. You can't have a one size fits all uh, standard that's gonna work in this country. If we're forced to adopt insurance capital standard, a European centric set of rules for- uh, The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, Ms. Beatty, you are recognized for five minutes. What happened? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, first of all, Madam Chair, let me uh, start by thanking you for your stellar leadership, for all the work that we have gotten done during this very difficult time, a uh, difficult time in this nation. And certainly as we've been confronted with COVID-19, all of the work that we did in helping save the lives through what we've gone through with our economic problems and with PPP and housing, uh, I just think it is very important for me to recognize uh, your work. Uh, with that said to our witnesses, thank you for being here today. Uh, many of my colleagues have talked about where we are and related it to the problems we've had or the successes that we've had with PPP. We've also talked about uh, the greater financial portfolio. Uh, we've talked about capital and liquidity and certainly uh, access to capital. But as I look to the title of this full committee uh, virtual hearing, we, we talk about oversight and we talk about it as it relates to uh, the departments that our witnesses oversee. We talk about it as we should in ensuring safety and the soundness of diversity. Certainly you all know as chair of the subcommittee on diversity, uh, I'd like to devote much of my time to that because I think it's most appropriate when we talk about the economic downturn, when we talk about the COVID-19 crises, and we talk about the social justices. Why? Because when we look at the disparities and how African-Americans and others are disproportionately affected, it's a clarion sound uh, bell that that is in the financial services area. Uh, Mr. Brooks, I'm gonna start with you and this will be very quick. Uh, all the other uh, witnesses have been asked this question. Uh, I take great honor that I've had the opportunity to be in the forefront with Omwe. So I don't wanna break my tradition by uh, not asking you, uh, do you know what Omwe is and have you met with your Omwe director and who is your director? Well, my director, Joyce Cofield, I consider to be a close friend and mentor. She and I meet for an hour every single week and have really leaned into a number of important initiatives here, which I'm happy to talk about if you like. Well, thank you very much. She has done a, a great job on that. Let me go to my next question. And if so, we can come back or offline, I can ask you some things. I have been very uh, disturbed when on September the 22nd, the president issued an executive order, 13950, which seeks to halt certain forms of diversity and inclusion training and contracting with programs in the federal government. So to each one of you, uh, yes or no, are you familiar with this? And the second question, yes or no, uh, have you ceased your diversity in training in your department? Mr. We'll start with you, Mr. Quarles. Uh, thank you. I'm I'm uh, somewhat familiar with it, although that order does not apply to the Federal Reserve, given the nature of the agency. Um, and we uh, have not changed our uh, practice. Thank you. And we know while independent agencies don't necessarily have to comply with the executive order, we also know that many of you have been known to voluntarily comply uh, with the order. Yes, we, we haven't changed our practice with respect to uh, the person. Okay, thank you. Next, we'll just go down the line. Mr. Brooks. Uh, I, I am familiar with the order. Uh, we are obviously a unit of the Treasury Department. There's a review process for our diversity programs, uh, but we continue to provide diversity programs that don't run into uh, any of the issues in that order. Uh, for other things, we go through a review process as required by the order. Okay, thank you. Um, and I will say that, uh, like the Fed, we're an independent agency um, and we generally comply with the spirit of the executive orders 
uh, we have been able to continue our diversity and training as uh, we have done in the past. Okay. And Representative Beatty, NCUA, we often strive to comply with the spirit of executive orders. In this case, this has been turned over to our general counsel for review. But I assure you, we're continuing to have outreach and engagement opportunities. In fact, I've spoken at over 20 uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion events, especially following the murder of George Floyd. It's been my responsibility to ensure that our employees have a safe place to talk and, and hear from me directly during this challenging time. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, I yield back my remaining five seconds. <laughs> Thank you for uh, your yield. Um, the gentleman's time has expired. Uh, the gentleman, Mr. Budd, is now recognized for five minutes. I thank the chair. I thank Mr. Green. So, just to clarify, I heard a, a mention earlier in this hearing about President elect Biden. Well, to my knowledge, none of the states in question have certified their results, and no state electors have met. So, there's really no president elect. So, we ask in the same the courtesies and the legal processes that were extended to Vice President Gore in the year 2000. Be, extend, be extended to President Trump in 2020. So as you're aware, Democrats lost seats in this body, and that is evidence enough that the American people recognize the failure of the far left socialist policies. Now this gives me concern regarding the next Congress, but we have several opportunities before us to seek more bipartisan solutions and to reject the extreme. So I wanna thank the panel here and as we continue to weather this pandemic, I appreciate uh, that you and all of your agencies have worked with our banks and our credit unions to provide some flexibility so that they can uh, provide access to credit and financial services to credit worthy consumers and credit worthy businesses. So uh, all of you uh, have shown your ability to work with our banks and credit unions, but it's now time for Congress to help out those consumers and those same businesses as well. And that's why I'm pleased to be an original co-sponsor on HR 7777, the Paycheck Protection Program Small Business Act. Now, this bipartisan bill would not only help millions of small businesses by forgiving all loans under $150,000 with a simple one-page uh, forgiveness form, but it would also free up countless hours and resources for our banks and our credit unions allowing them to focus on the core of banking, providing access to credit and financial services to individuals and businesses. As a result, some banks are crossing asset thresholds that subject them to greater regulatory burdens. So my question is this, uh, what are you all doing to ensure that these financial institutions aren't faced with potentially costly regulatory burdens just because they help with implementing a relief program? And, uh, Chair McWilliams, I'll start with you in reference. I think you may have made some comments to my colleague, Mr. Loudermilk, uh, in relation to that. So I'll start with you, uh, Chair. Sure, we're doing a number of things to make sure that uh, these thresholds do not uh, provide a disincentive for banks to engage with their borrowers, uh, individual consumers and small businesses. So we're, we're going through an interagency process to ascertain what all we need to do uh, to address those thresholds and to make sure that banks need to do what we want them to do, which is continue to stimulate the economy and, and be there for their consumers and customers. And with respect to the FDIC, we have already done a number of things, uh, including a, a change in what counts for the audit purposes thresholds, as well as excluding PPP uh, Fed facility assets from the deposit assessments for banks that have engaged in extensive PPP lending. Thank you very much. And I'll go and, and stop with uh, Comptroller Brooks, if you would please comment on that. Well, Congressman, thank you for the question. I would endorse what uh, Chairman Williams said. We were obviously part of the FDIC's process on that. The one other thing I would comment on is like the other agencies, we excluded PPP assets from our assessments uh, for the first half of the year. And we also adopted a supplemental leverage ratio uh, rule with the two other banking agencies to make sure that banks could exclude uh, uh, pandemic related deposit inflows from messing around with their capital ratios right, and, and with their leverage ratios. So I think all of those things that create a safe space for banks to proceed. Thank you. Uh, Vice Chair Quarles, during your testimony earlier this week on the Senate side of the Senate Banking Committee, you were asked about the Fed's plan to extend the exclusion that was made for the Supplementary Lending Ratio or SLR to the GSIB surcharge in order to ensure that capital is not increased at the end of this year. So I think your response to that question by the Fed um, has not heard concerns about this from the impacted bank. So I'm looking for clarification to that response because as I understand it, 
the Fed has discussed the likelihood of a capital increase uh, with the banks themselves. Um, I'm sure you're aware, along with every Republican member of this committee, you, uh, we sent you a letter requesting action on this so that uh, because we've been hearing from the banks that an increase in the GSIP scores could impact their ability to support the economy when we need it most. Uh, any comments on that? Uh, yeah, so the, the, the way the GSIP calculation uh, works, um, uh, and I didn't get into this uh, uh, with the Senate, but it's probably good that you've given me the chance to do that here. Uh, the way the GSIB calculation works is that there's not an immediate capital consequence for a firm uh, going over, uh, you know, moving up a bucket uh, in the GSIB uh, framework. Uh, uh, instead, that, that capital cons consequence would take place after a year. And the framework is designed specifically so that temporary changes uh, would not have the, the effect that you and we are concerned about here. Um, this will give us the chance, uh, if we think that those changes were likely to be durable, uh, to consider whether there should be adjustments made uh, or, over the course of time. So what, I, so what I was saying was that there's not an immediate capital consequence. We're not hearing that there's an immediate capital consequence. That's not how the framework works. And we have time to think this through, uh, should we discover that the, uh, the effect is gonna be more durable. Thank the you. gentleman's time, time has expired. Uh, Mr. Vargas of California is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Can you hear me? Quite well, Mr. Vargas. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here again. And I want to thank all of the witnesses today. I appreciate very much their testimony. It's a very difficult time, and I think uh, they're working very hard on behalf of the American people. Now, I have to say at the beginning of this a uh, hearing we Democrats were lectured on the issue of divisiveness, and now we were just lectured on the notion of who won. I think that uh, we won not only at the president level, but also at the congressional level. So I find it interesting that somehow the winners are the ones that are saying we were somehow rejected by the American people when we won. Uh, I'd also remind people that uh, four years ago when uh, Mr. Trump was running for president and Mr. Trump won about the same amount of electoral votes now as uh, Vice President uh, Biden has. We didn't like it, but of course we acknowledged it and we had a transition. Now to hear that we're in the same situation and we're not supposed to acknowledge that uh, Vice President uh, Biden has won is really rather ridiculous, just to be frank. Um, but and also divisiveness, I have to say this, I was on this committee for four years the previous chairman, all I heard was divisiveness, mostly around the issue of Dodd-Frank and, and other things too, but especially Dodd-Frank, it was demonized in particular. And I think I heard today from the witnesses how well Dodd-Frank has worked. Did I miss here or did I hear correctly that Dodd-Frank in fact was uh, very uh, beneficial during this time? Uh, why don't I have um, uh, uh, Vice Chair, Mr. Quartz, why don't you, uh, uh, respond to that. Has has it been helpful, Dodd-Frank? Uh, I, I think the increases in capital and liquidity uh, that were put in place after the after the 2008 crisis have been very helpful. A anyone else uh, disagree with that? Uh, how about um, Acting Controller, Mr. Brooks? How about yourself? <clears throat> no, I would echo uh, the Vice Chairman's comments. Now, I have to say that was when I first got on this committee, it was a far left sort of bill, they told me how unhelpful it was going to be. And I believe most of you were appointed by uh, President Trump. So anyway, I again, what becomes demonized and far on the left, all of a sudden becomes very helpful and in the middle. So again, I, I, I hope that we can work together and get away from this divisiveness and name calling. I don't think it works. And I do think we have a lot of work to do together and we should work together. Now, I, I, I do have some concerns about COVID-19 and where we are today. Um, COVID-19, of course, is a virus, and virus has this virus, as all viruses, have seasonality. In fact, recently, um, I think it was the, or the medical group said that you would see during the summer that you would have a, a, a diminution of COVID, and then in the autumn, it would come back, and then in the winter, it would spike. I'm very concerned about where we are here. In fact, um, recently here, very recently, I heard from both uh, Jerome Powell, the Fed chair, as well as Christine Lagarde, the head of the European Central Bank, that they're very concerned too about this. Could you comment on that? Because I, I do have um, great concerns that this is roaring back and we're gonna be in trouble. Mr. Quarles, why don't you do it? He's, uh, he works with you. 
Why don't you uh, comment first? Was he wrong? Uh, well, I, I think there's a great deal of uncertainty uh, about how the uh, how the situation will evolve, uh, and so we shouldn't be complacent about that as we look at questions of financial stability uh, and uh, within the Fed's remit uh, economic uh, uh, support as well. How about Mr. Brooks? How about yourself? <clears throat> well, Congressman, I think that. Um, the uh, watchword here is uncertainty. There's a lot of uh, negative information out there, including increases in uh, cases and hospitalizations. There's also a lot of positive news out there, including the approval of new therapeutics, the reduction in the length of hospital space, and effective vaccines. So I think a lot of it depends on our reaction to it at this point. Uh, I think they took that into account, too, when they commented. In fact, um, they still say the uncertainty is something that worries them. Um, how about... Uh, Chairman McWilliams, what do you think about that? I don't know if you heard their statement, but their statement was concerning to me. So we're certainly monitoring the conditions on the ground to make sure we understand uh, what related business closures may be happening in different jurisdictions. Uh, we're working closely with our regional offices to make sure that uh, we are appropriately addressing any issues that may come up for our banks that are trying to help uh, consumers stay in their homes and small businesses continue to operate. So I would say that uh, certainly, we're, we're, we're very careful about um, analyzing the numbers and understanding what our regulatory response should be. Uh, thank you. I guess my time has almost expired. What I would say is this, let, let us, let's try to work together. I think it would be important. Um, and let's get away from this divisive. And let's acknowledge what happened, too, in this race. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. My time has expired. Has expired. Uh, Mr. Kustoff is now recognized for five minutes. Chairman, and I, I want to thank all the witnesses for appearing today. And, and I do want to echo the comments of the ranking member and so many others this afternoon that have talked about the incredible work that all of you have done, uh, the witnesses, in protecting the soundness of our, of our financial system over these last eight months. I think you've uh, not only given a lot of stability to people across the nation, but you provided relief to businesses that frankly have, have struggled initially and, and, to, uh, and to those individuals who struggled. So thank you for all of your hard work. Comptroller Brooks, if I can uh, for you, back in May, the OCC completed and updated uh, the Community Reinvestment Act. Obviously, these were important changes that were made. They, were, they weren't trivial changes. It was a complete regulatory overhaul. Under the new framework, banks are going to be assigned a CRA grade based on whether they meet certain benchmarks and community development minimums. But when the rule was adopted, the OCC didn't necessarily define what the benchmarks would be. As I understand it, and the way I interpret it, you wanted a separate rulemaking process for setting those benchmarks. Now, of course, here we are about six months later, the OCC still has not started the second rulemaking process. Can you talk to us about your, your plan, what the OCC's plan is, and how you're gonna provide banks with the certainty regarding their responsibilities under the regulation? Uh, Congressman, absolutely, and thank you for that question. Um, so first of all, I would tell you that we're just a few days away from releasing the Notice of Proposed Rulemaking on performance standards, so you'll see that very shortly, I would expect by next week. Um, in terms of the work that we've done, uh, one of the uh, things that we were able to do uh, post adopting the original CRA rule <clears throat> was to bring on board one of the world's leading banking economists to lead our economics function, and uh, Dr. Calamiris has had a significant role in helping us think through what the performance assessments ought to look like. So the onboarding of a new economics leadership team has been one of the reasons it took us a few extra weeks beyond what we would have hoped, but the good news is we've now had that level of input to make sure we get it right. What I can tell you that you'll see in the, in the rule when it comes out in just a few days is a couple of things. First of all, we're going to be moving from a highly relativistic standard under the old rule, uh, where we basically uh, had banks compete with each other to see who got the A grade. So it was both subjective and relativistic. And we're hoping to move toward a more objective and predictable 
kind of standard. So you'll know that you have to hit this threshold in order to get an outstanding and this threshold in order to get a satisfactory, et cetera. That's a significant change from, from in the olden days. The way that I like to put it is we want to see CRA as more like a math test and less like an English test. Satisfactory shouldn't be in the eye of the beholder. It should be predictable so banks know how to meet uh, what we expect of them. And the other thing that we've said is that we'll be holding banks accountable for meeting or exceeding their previous levels of CRA uh, uh, contributions. So we know that one of the concerns expressed by commenters in the original rule was that somehow our new framework was going to result in a reduction of CRA activity. We're confident it isn't, and the performance standards will speak to that issue uh, in terms of who gets a pass and who doesn't. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. My chairman would close if I can. Some discussion earlier, uh, questioning from Congressman Barr about de novo banks, and I think we're all concerned that we've not seen uh, we've not seen the creation of de novo banks since over the last ten years, like we did uh, prior to two thousand eight. Can you, if you if you can, just to set the stage, what are the primary factors that have led to the lack of de novo banks over the last decade and what, if anything, can we as, as Congress do to facilitate the noble banks? Uh, well, I, I, I think the primary factor is um, uh, is more of a it's more of a question of mindset. Uh, there had, leading up to the two thousand eight two thousand nine uh, crisis, uh, been uh, a a significant. Uh, spate of de novo banks uh, approved, uh, particularly in some jurisdictions. Many of those uh, banks failed, um, uh, and uh, and that has resulted in a caution over the course of the last decade in the regulatory system generally about the approval of de novo banks. Uh, myself, I think that's a little bit of a question of uh, a, a, a matter of a cat that sat on a hot stove. Uh, won't do it again, but it won't sit on a cold stove either. And that there are things we can do and have done to improve and streamline the regulatory environment for small banks to help uh, make uh, establishing one more attractive. The Thank you very much. time has expired. Uh, Mr. Lawson of Florida is now recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And I would also like to uh, thank the uh, uh, panel here for this discussion today. Uh, and I know that uh, uh, there's been a lot of things that has occurred uh, since we've been with this pandemic. And so I, I would have asked uh, the vice chairman for us the, uh, the federal emergency COVID-19 facilities were created to support uh, a broad cross section of the financial market and economy supporting uh, the availability of credit for households, helping small and medium sized businesses maintain and pay payroll and employees uh, through new and expanded loans, providing credit to larger employees so that they are able to pay supplies and maintain their business uh, operation. However, the facilities are set to expire at the end of 2020. Uh, do you know if the feds and the treasurer already created a plan to help these business maintain uh, on their feet and, and meet payroll as COVID would still be a concern next year? Uh, well, certainly the 13-3 facilities that we put in place in conjunction with Treasury uh, have uh, been very uh, helpful uh, in restoring uh, market function uh, and the availability of credit across a broad uh, swath of the economy, as you, uh, as you note. Um, uh, the, question, the question of whether in light of the um, uh, in light of the performance of the economy since the spring, they should be extended is one that we are currently engaged on. And while the uh, economic progress since the spring has been better than many people, including we at the Fed, expected that it might, we're still a long ways away uh, from being on the other side of the COVID event. Unemployment is too high. Uh, small businesses are, are under credit pressure. Uh, so we'll want to take all of that into account as we consider this question. We haven't made a decision on it yet. We're talking with the Treasury about it. Uh, but obviously, we need to decide that before the end of the year. Okay, thank you. And I'd be interested to see uh, what happened with your conversation with the Treasury, uh, because this is a, a major problem. And throughout, when I travel uh, throughout the district and so forth, I get more questions about that uh, uh, than anything else, uh, because there's still a great deal of 
uh, the limb was there. But, uh, but Mr. Vice Chairman, I have one other thing. In September 2020, the Fed banned its stock buybacks and, and has constrained dividends payments by a large bank to safeguard uh, the wealth against COVID-19. However, I think it's safe to say uh, that Fed's officials don't want to repeat the history by using government funds to capitalize in, uh, banks' rights. So why didn't the Fed prohibit dividends payment entirely, given the economy uh, activity would likely be constrained until the end of the pandemic is over? Uh, well, uh, thank you for that. As you note, that we did uh, uh, constrain uh, we did constrain dividends. Uh, we uh, prevented them from being increased and we subjected them to an income test. Uh, most importantly, uh, we uh, prohibited uh, share of purchases, um, uh, which is for our large, large banks, how 70% of their capital distributions are made. So the great bulk of capital distributions uh, uh, have been suspended. Uh, the result of that is that even is that during this COVID event, even while the banks have been taking very large provisions, uh, particularly in the second quarter, uh, for expected credit losses, capital at these institutions has actually increased. Uh, it increased in the second quarter, and it's increased in the third quarter. We're now running uh, uh, detailed stress tests with two different scenarios, given the uncertainty as to how the world might evolve. Uh, and we'll release publicly the results of those stress tests uh, before the end of the year, uh, which will give us much more insight into uh, the bank's resilience uh, in light of the economic circumstances uh, we're facing. Uh, and then we'll make a decision as to whether we should extend, modify uh, in any way the, the capital constraints that we have. Okay, thank you. And Mr. Chairman, with that, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Uh, Mr. Hollingsworth is now recognized for five minutes. Mr. Hollingsworth. Good afternoon. I appreciate it. Yes, sir. I am, uh, should be off mute now. Can you hear me? Quite well, sir. Thank you. Perfect. Terrific. Well, I want to thank all the panelists as well for being here today. Uh, first question goes to Mr. Quarles. I know Bud touched on this a little bit earlier, but I want to come back to it and put a finer point on it. I was admittedly a little bit stymied, I say respectfully, to your answer to Senator Rounds yesterday when he asked about the GSIB surcharge and some of the effects that our largest institutions because of an increase in deposits are seeing on moving into the next category in terms of the GSIP surcharge. Uh, you said in response to Senator Round's question, we're not, we are not hearing from the large firms that changes in their balance sheet over the period of the COVID event might lead them to be pushed up into a higher bucket. I just wanted to confirm to you uh, that I certainly am hearing from those institutions that this will be a challenge. They are certainly telling their investors that this would be a challenge. Recently, JP Morgan's CFO said, and I quote, in the absence of rate calibration, which we remain hopeful about, managing that back down, she means back down into a lower category GSIP surcharge, will certainly be challenging. Certainly something that she is already thinking about, something that JP Morgan is already planning on. And I recognize that you have sufficient time to still make moves on this next year, but many of those capital allocation decisions are already being made. I and every other Republican member on this committee also sent a letter a couple of weeks ago asking about this same thing. I just wanted to confirm to you and hear your confirmation that this is an important issue. This is something that you are hearing about, that I am hearing about, that others of the Fed are hearing about and will at least begin to think about. Ah. Yes, uh, absolutely. My uh, reference to uh, Senator Rounds to Buck uh, capital buckets as opposed to the GSIB uh, 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 surcharge buckets. Uh, and, and as I explained, there is a, uh, we have a year time frame in which to see what the consequences are. You're absolutely right that uh, if banks aren't sure uh, uh, whether, uh, you know, what accommodations will be made or how they see their um, uh, balance sheets evolving organically, uh, that they will need to take uh, uh, steps well before a year from now uh, right. in order to uh, manage their GSIP position. But uh, we do have uh, time to, uh, to think that question through because of the way the, the uh, GSIB framework is structured. 
I understand. And certainly I don't want you to not think it through. Don't think I'm a proponent of that, but I just want to make sure that it is being thought about and that we all recognize collectively that this is a real issue and it's going to start to have meaningful impacts on our large institutions even earlier than a year from now. Absolutely. Unquestionably. Perfect. Wonderful. Um, to you, uh, Chairman McWilliams, I wanted to ask about your FDIC rule, reg modernizing the regulatory framework for broker deposits. You said, I think earlier today or perhaps yesterday, that this should be finalized before the end of the year. Is that correct? That is correct. Wonderful. Yes. Well, I know I sent a letter along with many others about how we can work through the facilitating portion of that rule. I know that I expressed some real concern that the restrictive nature of how you thus far have defined facilitating might lead to an adverse impact on some of our community banks. As a part of finalizing that rule before the end of the year, do you expect there to be changes to the facilitating definition, enabling our community banks to use third party servicers for some of their in critical technology and infrastructure? I can't engage in specifics of the of what the final rule will look like, but I can certainly tell you that the reason we have the notice and comment process is to solicit the type of a feedback that you and others have provided so that we can improve the rulemaking before it becomes finalized. Wonderful. Well, I certainly appreciate that. I certainly understand that. Please know that from my perspective and so many of the community institutions all the way across our district and all the way across the country, this is something that really concerns them. They utilize these third party vendors to enable them to compete with larger institutions that have that technology, have those capabilities in house. They don't want to see themselves be deprived of those infrastructure pieces so that they can compete for consumer attention, for consumer deposits, for more opportunities for them and their consumers. So please know, at least uh, from our standpoint, that's an important thing to tweak. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I shall yield back. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. The um, gentlewoman, Ms. Talib, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you so much, Chairman, and thank you all so much for being with us. Um, I know in the financial stability report released this week, the board had acknowledged that climate change is uh, financially, um, a financially st uh, stability risk. And so one of my questions, as I represent um, Wayne County, which has one of the um, porous air qualities in Michigan and hasn't met the Clean Air Act standards uh, in over a decade. So um, I do want to talk specifically about Marathon Petroleum Refinery, um, which is in my district. And they had repeatedly had a number of violations um, recognized by the state of Michigan and continue the residents that live near that refinery continue to have a number of concerns and issues that they can that they bring to my office uh, almost daily. So marathon bonds are also owned right now by the Fed, uh, basically the public. $15 million worth of bonds that we we own right now. And, and you all know I wrote a letter to the board where I highlighted how along with marathon, nearly 20% of, of the Fed's secondary market corporate credit facility portfolio is bond is bonds from the energy for the energy and utility companies. So I'd like to ask um, Vice Chair Corollis, um, you know, what do I tell my constituents about this? I mean, when they see this and they see the various headlines, when they see they find out that the public's resources and our money and the risk on us, uh, it's not investment into state and local governments, but instead invested in very the very companies that are in their communities that are responsible for bad air quality uh, in their community? Um, uh, well, uh, uh, thank you for that. The, the Federal Reserve facilities, I mean, we do have a facility for state and local governments uh, that has been uh, serving a useful uh, market support how function. Many, how many cities have benefited from that? Uh, uh, so I'm getting that uh, information now um, mm -hmm. because I want to respond uh, precisely. Um, uh, three uh, issues, the, the MLF got three issues, but its principal function is to uh, restore the capacity of private markets and, and muni markets have healed ac across the board. Uh, but uh, for those facilities to do their job, we at the Fed uh, uh, you know, can't uh, be involved in credit allocation. We established broad uh, parameters uh, and and the allocated decisions as opposed to the market support decisions are really for Congress. 
I do, I do, I do want to get very centered on, on. So the report came from you, know, the financial stability report that acknowledges the risk of climate change, that how it poses a financial kind of it poses instability in our in our economy. I mean, what what are what are the board's plans to change the corporate credit facilities account of those risks? Are we just ignoring them? And I still want an answer to how many cities you all helped through the MLF program. There were three purchases. I said that. The um, uh, but the but the Muni facility operates mostly through its effect on the broad market, and the broad market has healed substantially. The um, uh, the uh, uh, so our, with respect to climate, you know, we're looking at that. Uh, 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 from a, a broad systemic point of view, as opposed to a uh, uh, as opposed but to is, specific isn't purchases, purchasing, isn't purchase? I mean, isn't holding these you know bonds? I mean, millions of dollars in bonds and marathon refinery create instability. I mean, it's like you're trying to create stability, but your own report says climate change is posing financial instability. Then why are we why aren't we just basically saying, hey, we're going to move away from this and maybe focus on local and state governments? And by the way, no, I, that, that I, was I, not the conclusion of the report at all uh, that we should. Saying, uh, what was it saying? It was it saying wasn't it saying that there was a climate change issue? Uh, I do think that the, there is a climate change issue, but we have certainly not concluded uh, that the uh, uh, mechanism to address climate change is credit allocation. That should not come from the Federal Reserve. If there is a credit allocation decision to be made, that's a decision for Congress uh, uh, to be debated so by the public's representatives. Yeah, I agree. I understand. And we're, I'm working on that, as you probably know. Why aren't we, um, you know, why aren't we helping local and state governments more? I mean, it sounds like we only helped one or two states. And I'm, I mean, what cities benefited from the MLF program so far? I mean, we're in a pandemic. They were in survivor mode prior to this pandemic. They literally are the frontline communities, Vice Chair Coral. I mean, literally, the, the frontline communities that's stopping the spread of COVID. And you don't even know how many cities all helped. The gentle lady's time has expired. We will accept the answer in the record. Um, and Thank I'm you. advised by the chairwoman that I'm to announce that at 3.30 we have a hard stop and that I'm to get as many persons in as possible between now and 3.30. With this said, uh, the gentleman, Mr. Gonzalez, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chair. And uh, thank you to our panel for being here. I want to start my questions with uh, Mr. Quarles uh, and, and go back to the SOFR conversation a, a bit and, and try to put some fine points on some of your earlier comments. Uh, first question, how has SOFR stood up from a stability and suitability standpoint uh, during the pandemic? Uh, well, our experience uh, with SOFR during the pandemic is that as a reference rate, it stood up quite well. Great. Um, and then just a more direct question. At this point, is there any reason to believe that SOFR would not be a suitable replacement for LIBOR going forward? Uh, no, uh, particularly for capital markets uh, and derivatives transactions, which are the bulk of the transactions that use LIBOR as a reference rate. Great. And then could you clarify what you meant uh, when you said earlier that the plan is to allow the existing contracts to mature on the LIBOR rate without needing a congressional solution, uh, given that so many of the contracts would in fact expire after LIBOR would go away. Can you just kind of clarify that one for us? Uh, yeah, so um, yeah, the, the issue that we've had is that uh, extensions of LIBOR, uh, which there have been a couple of over the course of the, of the last decade after it became clear that it would be going away, um, uh, result in the writing of new contracts. Uh, and so the problem just perpetuates itself. Uh, I, I think that the, the best uh, solution would be a framework in which we allowed the existing contracts, we created an environment in which the existing contracts could mature on their current basis without renegotiation, without change to a different rate, uh, but that new contracts would not be written uh, and over a relatively short period of time, the bulk of existing contracts would run off. These are not usually long contracts. Then there are a, uh, there's a hard tail of contracts that would uh, require a longer time, uh, and legislation could be useful uh, to help with those. I think once it became clearer what the nature of that hard tail was, 
uh, and we had more time to think through, therefore, uh, potential legislative responses, that the combination of some mechanism to allow the, uh, the bulk of the existing contracts to mature with time over the course of the next year, year and a half, uh, to think about the legislative solution for those that won't, uh, would be the best approach. Thanks. And then with respect to that hardtail, how soon would you suspect we would need to act congressionally or otherwise before we would start to see implications in the broader economy, in the real economy? You're on mute. You yeah, sorry. My mute seemed to be on a hair trigger and every time. I, but the uh, um, uh, the I, I, I think it, we're we're still working through that issue currently. It's not a it's not a long time. I think probably a year, year and a half. This this is something that we should be engaged with uh, the folks who are concerned on the issue up in the all over the board. Yeah, I, I hope to to work with you in your office on that. I, I personally think we need to act a bit sooner than a year and a half. Um, but you know, we, we I'm sure we can hammer that out. Um, I want to shift now to Chairman McWilliams. Um, one of the things we've talked about is the difficulty of MDIs and community banks at adopting technology. Um, this year, the FDIC issued an RFI for public input on the idea of fostering creation of a public-private standard setting organization for tech vendors and models seeking to work with community banks. The idea is that small banks need to be able to adopt the technology developed by third parties, uh, but those organizations need to meet standards to be sure tools are effective, secure, and compliant. Uh, can you just talk a bit in my last minute uh, what your vision for this program is? Uh, what problems you're trying to solve and how this will make our community banks uh, more competitive. Sure. And, and we have a minute, so I'm trying to get all of this in a minute. Um, so I realized early in my tenure that, uh, you know, one of the elements for survivability of community banks will be to engage with third-party service providers, primarily fintechs and technology companies that can help them deliver better products, more products, and reach more customers, especially in rural areas, as discussed earlier in the hearing. And I, I reached out to several Silicon Valley firms. I went and I met with them, uh, technology firms, and the partner with banks, banks, and I asked them, what can be done to help you partner up with these banks more quickly? We don't regulate these firms. And fintechs, but you know, they through the third-party service arrangements, they were able to provide this feedback to us. And they said that for in the beginning, when they approach a bank to uh, be onboarded with a bank, they have to go through the same due diligence process with each and every bank. So we said, why don't we kind of uh, cut out that uh, process uh, and and make it very simple, where they get certified to this private-public partnership, and then use that certification to ease the burden on the banks and use the burden on the fintechs when they partner up. Thank you. I think it's a fantastic idea. The time has expired. Um, the chair recognizes Ms. Porter. Um, not hearing from Ms. Porter, the gentleman now, uh, I will now recognize Ms. Waxton. Ms. Wexton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to the witnesses for appearing today. I want to switch gears and talk a little bit about um, something that I kind of see as a potential ticking time bomb in our financial system, and that is the commercial real estate market. Uh, Chairwoman McWilliams, there has been a rapid growth in CRA, CRA exposure, especially for smaller banks. Is that correct? Uh, well, they have had high concentrations in CRE portfolios, uh, and it was one of the primary concerns we had in the last crisis as well. And currently, the FDIC considers at least 356 banks as concentrated in the commercial real estate bank market. Is that correct? Uh, I, the number sounds right. I don't know how. Um, I'll, it may be slightly outdated. So what, is, what do you mean by concentrated when you say concentrated? Where the majority of their portfolio or a very large number of their portfolio, we don't have a magic number. We don't, you know, we don't tell them it's X percentage uh, has exposure and is heavily concentrated in the CRE market. But that means that, that by concentrated, you mean that they're exceeding the FDIC's regulatory criteria or your recommended proportion of a portfolio being made up of, C of commercial real estate portfolio. So so we don't have like a clear cut number where it depends on an individual institution and we try not to manage our institutions with, with that kind of a blunt cut instrument by telling them it's X percentage. But we would look at the, each individual institution, look at their risk management profile, capital levels, uh, their camel ratings, management experience. Do they know how to manage this? Did they go through the last crisis? 
with uh, these issues as well and, and how did they fare. So I would say we have a more of an individual ad hoc uh, bespoke, if you'd like, approach to how we look at commercial real estate exposures at individual community banks. But it's fair to say that that these are these are institutions that are more likely to fail if we see commercial loans go bad in large numbers. Is that correct? Uh, I would say that it would be one of the factors that could lead to their failure if the, if it's not managed appropriately and the management doesn't ex have experience with how to deal with it. So what are some of the indicators or warning signs that we're seeing now in the commercial real estate sector that 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 give you can cause for concern in the FDIC? So we're certainly looking at, at a number of buildings, and there was just an article this morning uh, that, that are um, uh, folks are subletting their leases. They're realizing they don't need the, the high level of occupancy and the square footage that they have seen in the past. And so we are working with our banks to make sure they understand what the exposure is. This is not a kind of a snapshot in time exposure. Most of these leases are multi-year, in some case, multi-decade uh, leases. And uh, we want to make sure that small banks in particular have the ability to manage those portfolios, are working proactively with their borrowers. They understand uh, where the companies uh, that own these buildings uh, are, are, um, are in their economic cycle and also um, reaching out to um, both regulators, us, uh, and their examiners in charge if they foresee any issues. Losses, but, but these losses are often slow to materialize because of the duration of those loans and everything. For the example, first part, yes. recession, they didn't they didn't peak until three years after the 2009 recession is that correct so i'm sorry the question it broke up in the first part of the question can you repeat it well, please? i was just saying that, that that it takes it takes a while for these losses to materialize because of the duration of the loans it generally does yes right but the fallout when these when these loans go bad won't just be contained to the banking sector right because can you talk about a little bit about the exposure to pension funds and other, other sure and what that will mean. Sure, and it, it's, it truly is an ecosystem. I mean, the, the reason that some of those folks who are renting commercial space uh, are unable to make their payments is because the commercial activity has subsided, which is generally a sign of the economic downturn. And so that's something we have tried, frankly, to prevent with some of the actions we have taken over um, over the past few months. Certainly, the, the, the ecosystem doesn't stop with the borrower and the lender. Uh, you know, th there are investors in the banks that um, have exposure here as well. Uh, to the extent that, uh, that, that these um, these uh, commercial real estate loans get uh, securitized, you know we have exposure on the secondary market, as you mentioned. So I, it's it's a, it's it's not a simple formula so where there's you know two X. So we're running out of time, so I just would ask: other than banks increasing their reserves to absorb loan losses, what else should we be doing to head off this situation? Is there anything else that you recommend? So certainly, I can tell you that from our perspective, we're working with individual banks that have high concentrations in the affected industries, including commercial real estate throughout the country. Um, I, I can't think of any recommendations um, um, right off the bat. Um, if we exhaust our regulatory discretion in how we can address and work with these, I will certainly let you know. But the best thing we could do and is... In my, in, my 15 seconds, in my last 15 seconds, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but... But do you, do you think that you have the authority to extend the trouble debt restructuring period beyond six months as a regulatory matter, of course, or do you need statutory authorization to do that? So there are two different TDRs, one in the CARES Act. One is our personal individual that we, that we negotiated with FASB. It would take a concurrence by FASB to do so for us. The gentle lady's time has expired. The chair now recognizes Ms. Porter for five minutes. Thank you. Um, Mr. Quarles, um, can you, the Fed is largely responsible for dispensing the $500 billion in taxpayer money that Congress provided as a bailout for corporate America, the biggest bailout in our country's history, potentially. Using taxpayer dollars to buy bank debt was never part of that plan. In fact, the Federal Reserve stated explicitly in this document that it would not be purchasing bank debt. What happened? Um, I, I I couldn't quite tell. I I've got I'm on the uh, uh, I, I, on the grid. I couldn't quite see what the document was, so I'm not quite sure what document. It was the was Federal printed. Reserve's. It was the Federal Reserve's own um, rules regarding the um, frequently asked questions for the primary market corporate. Um, credit facility. And what it says, in fact, is that what bonds will be included, and it says those that are issued by an issuer that is not an insured depository institution, 
depository institution holding company or subsidiary of a depository holding company, in other words, a bank. So the, the, the secondary market liquidity facility, yeah. the corporate credit facility and secondary market corporate credit facility said they weren't going to be buying bank debt. That's in the FAQs, which I'm going to put into the record yeah. for what happened then. Why are you buying bank? Why is the Fed bailing out the big banks? Yeah, so I, I understand the question now. No, we we uh, haven't bought uh, bank debt in those facilities. You uh, to begin the so to begin the. No, we're claiming my time, Mr. Quarles. Has the Fed, as part of coronavirus bailout, purchased bank debt? Yes or no? No, we have okay. purchased. What's an exchange traded fund, Mr. Quarles? As I was getting ready to say, we have purchased exchange traded funds at the very beginning of the process in order to jumpstart the uh, reignition of the economy. And we stopped purchasing exchange, exchange traded funds several months ago. Um, are, do exchange traded funds for everyone who's watching, those are just baskets basically of stocks issued by a variety of companies. Um, and is it not correct that the Fed bought $1.3 billion in ETFs? That, that number sounds right. Okay, so this is a but that's not article $1. showing billion dollars of bank debt. Okay, no, so it's 1.3 billion in exchange traded funds. Um, and these, my question for you is, um, how much of that was bank debt in those exchange traded funds? Yeah, I can get that information for you. I don't have the numbers in front of me. Well, it was a lot, right? I mean, the bank, the bank money that's in these exchange traded funds, this is companies like JP Morgan Chase, their debt is in there. Um, and, you know, it's a big problem that you did this. A white paper published by the Yale School of Management showed that in fact, 15% of all that ETF purchase was for big banks. And ultimately to the tune of more than $2 billion in taxpayer money. Despite, not this is a headline from Bloomberg. Despite stated exclusion, the Fed is buying bank debt. Would you like to revise your statement about your earlier answer when I asked you whether or not the Fed had purchased bank debt as part of coronavirus relief? No, my, that answer was entirely accurate. We have not purchased bank debt. We purchased ETFs, those ETFs. Do those ETFs we, contain bank debt? The ETFs contain a portion of bank debt. We stopped buying the ETFs several months ago. It was important to buy the ETFs in order to jumpstart the general process of restoring the economy, which has benefited everyone. So what happened here is you said you wouldn't buy bank debt. Then you crafted a loophole or using ETF so the Fed could buy bank debt, a loophole buried in a subparagraph of rules on the Fed's website. And this loophole essentially swallowed up $2 billion in taxpayer money during COVID to bail out big banks, even as you told the public that the money could not go to any bank. We did not purchase any bank debt. If we had not purchased the ETFs, we would have had a credit market implosion that would have uh, that would have been that would have been devastating to the economy. No one would have wanted that. As soon as that was no longer uh, necessary, we stopped we're purchasing my ETFs. Time. We're cleaning my time. Um, who is the world's largest issuer of ETFs? I, I don't know off the top of my head. Probably BlackRock. Uh, BlackRock. BlackRock. Yes, I think you do know that BlackRock. Who's the, who is Larry Fink? Larry Fink is the CEO of BlackRock. Did the Fed hire Larry Fink and BlackRock to advise it, and this seems beyond belief to me, to buy BlackRock's own ETF products? I'm sorry, the, the alarm had gone off. has expired. Uh, the answer may be submitted for the record. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mr. Williams, Chairman, may I submit these documents documents. for the record? It will be placed in the record without objection. Thank you. Mr. Rose is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Chairwoman Waters and Ranking Member McHenry. And thank you to our witnesses for being here today. Uh, like many of my colleagues, I also want to thank you for the great work uh, done by our regulators throughout this pandemic response. Your swift efforts to accommodate regulatory and supervisory policies were extremely important. And moving forward, I urge you to continue to be flexible to ensure a strong economic recovery. Nearly 60% of the automated teller machines in the United States are independent non-bank terminals. It is those ATMs that are typically found in low-income communities and thinly populated rural areas 
in which there are few, if any, bank offices or bank-owned ATMs. The widespread closures and denials of bank accounts to businesses within the independent non-bank ATM industry present a serious threat to the financial stability not only of consumers who live in the areas served almost exclusively by independent non-bank ATMs, but also the tens of thousands of retail and service businesses serving these consumers on a daily basis. In a financial services hearing on Feb February 15, 2018, the National ATM Council's Tim Baxter testified about the, quote, widespread and severe consequences that in recent years have resulted from financial institutions' practice of de-risking, uh, unquote. And I might add the prejudicial treatment that was a direct result of federal regulators' implementation of Operation Choke Point in 2013. He noted that it is impossible for ATM operators to do business without having a bank account. But even with the end of the Operation Choke Point initiative, independent ATM providers were increasingly um, being notified by their banks without explanation that their deposit accounts were to be closed or in some cases already had been closed. My question for uh, you, Chairman McWilliams, Vice Chair Quarles, and Acting uh, Comptroller Brooks is, could each of you describe what the regulators are doing to address the fallout, the ongoing fallout from Operation Choke Point and its effect on ATM owners and the operators who are still having their accounts closed? Uh, Chair McWilliams, you might begin. Sure, and I, and I suspected the question is coming my way, so I reached out for the pronouncements we have issued in the past. Uh, certainly, we have made, um, I would say, um, um, very con concentrated and concerted effort to make sure that our institutions understand and offer services uh, to the businesses in their communities, um, including um, um, businesses that might have been um, ostracized in the past by um, so-called Operation Choke Point. I can, I can, um, I have a statement I issued in uh, November of 2018. Uh, telling our colleagues at the FDIC uh, to make sure that we, when we examine banks, that we are clear in our communication. We have uh, resolved a lawsuit that was pending against the, the um, FDIC in connection with uh, Operation uh, Choke Point, um, uh, even though that operation wasn't um, necessarily um, named Operation Choke Point by the FDIC. But in any case, uh, we have issued a statement basically saying that uh, financial institutions should have uh, the ability to assess the risk profile of individual clients and uh, do so in accordance with their um, risk appetite and management practices. And then uh, we have a statement that we have issued in 2015, basically saying that the FDIC encourages institutions to take a risk-based approach in assessing individual customer relationships rather than declining to provide banking services to entire categories of customers without regard to the risks presented by an individual customer or the bank's ability to manage the risk. Uh, so we have, I, I don't know what else to say to tell you the truth, to, to make sure that it resonates down to individual institutions level that uh, they should not shut out the entire industry or the entire type of business, but that they should manage that risk based on their risk um, appetite and um, management's experience in handling the type of risk that they may be concerned about. Thank you, Chair McWilliams. And I see our time is about to expire. Uh, I recently led a bipartisan letter to the three of you, uh, Chair McWilliams, Vice Chair Quarles, and, and Comptroller Brooks. And I would just encourage you, uh, the three of you, to respond to that in a timely uh, manner. And thank you for your answer, uh, Chair McWilliams. And with that, I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. Uh, the gentleman's time has expired. Mr. Taylor is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, appreciate this hearing. I think this is important. Uh, I wanted to dig down on forbearance uh, with our banking institutions. Uh, I recall the March 13th guidance that came out about forbearance for banks. Uh, this, this question, by the way, uh, Mr. Brooks, is for you in your capacity as the acting comp comptroller for the office of OCC. My question is, at what point are you going to start telling banks you forbeared long enough 
it is time that you start looking at foreclosure for assets. You know, this, this borrower cannot pay. Um, you know, how are you thinking about the end of forbearance? And, and I'll say that forbearance is extremely important. We've seen real trouble in the commercial real estate space building what Ms. Wexton was talking about earlier, uh, where you've got CMBS loans that don't have a forbearance mechanism in them that the OCC has been able to guide for banks. So that's made banks much more flexible as a credit facility. But at some point, that flexibility ends. Where do you think it will end, Mr. Clarkson? Uh, uh, Congressman, that is a great uh, and really important point. So I would start by saying one of the lessons we learned in the financial crisis is that two things um, in, a, in a downturn like this are equally important. One is making sure that you provide loss mitigation guidance and forbearance for everybody who can during a crisis. The other is unwinding all of that as soon as the crisis abates. Right. And the reason I say that is so important is that the data in the financial crisis shows that those states that extended long eviction moratoriums and long for foreclosure prevention programs long after the immediate crisis was there had the most sustained real estate downturns, the longest term unemployment and the most sustained sort of decline in overall real estate prices relative to states that came back to normal faster. So our basic view is it was appropriate to put forbearance programs in place right away as soon as the pandemic was recognized as a crisis. But it will be equally important to go back to normal with not one moment to spare, lest we repeat the mistakes of kind of the 2012, 13, 14 era post-financial crisis. And so uh, the way we look at things is basically this. First of all, banks learned in the financial crisis that it's in their interest to make net present value positive loan modifications. They, they get that. And every CEO I talk about is fully aware of the fact that anybody who reasonably can repay should be kept in the loan or kept in the property until such point as they're able to start doing that. There will come a time, almost certainly, that where there will be some amount of long-term permanent economic damage here. And in those circumstances, we're not doing anybody a favor by pretending like those assets are still assets on the balance sheet of a, of a property. The reason that mortgages and secured loans uh, are a lot cheaper than credit card loans and unsecured loans, obviously, is because they are secured by collateral. And at a certain point, the safety and soundness of the system requires that execution against the collateral occur. I don't think we're there yet. It's very clear that at this point, we are still in the midst of the late stages of the pandemic. But I'd be surprised if in one or two quarters, given the vaccine, the therapeutics, the economic upturn, at some point, the data will suggest that a return to normal is required. And at that point, we're going to need to go back to normal uh, treatment of collateral. OK, well, that's that that is uh, that is helpful. So you're you're sort of saying one to two quarters. And then are you. As you go and do your inspections with banks, with institutions, are you, you know, when it's clear to you, look, this this company's in bankruptcy, or you know, they, their their customer base is completely gone. There's just no way they're 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 not coming back anytime, you know, in the near future. Are you pushing those institutions to 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 start to foreclose and and move with the collateral, or are you still saying, you know what, just keep it on your books, forbear, let's just keep your balance sheet strong or make it look strong, even though it's not strong, it's actually weakened. Yeah, no, I, 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 Congressman, I would say just, just the opposite. So one thing I've been very clear about, and I've been speaking to state bank trade associations about this twice a week for the last six or eight weeks, and that is, you know, we're not blaming any banks for originated good credits that sure. went south in the pandemic, right? But what we are very focused on is making sure that banks are classifying loans as it becomes clear that they're not going to repay so that we can assess that risk. They can take provisions and they can prepare to do charge offs and foreclosures on the back end of that. We've been very focused on that. Having said that, there is good news uh, still in the system. And this picks up on a point uh, Vice Chair Quarles made a couple of hours ago which is there's still some amount of dry powder in the system from the PPP program and a series of other uh, programs put in place. So we can still see in bank in deposit accounts that there is enough runway even for some small businesses that are not currently doing business to continue to make payments out of the proceeds of those loans. That runway obviously will expire. And when it expires and there's no reasonable prospect of those customers going back in business, uh, there will be foreclosures and defaults at that point. It's one of the reasons I emphasize the need to okay. restart the economy. My, my time has expired. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Brooks, yield back. The gentleman's time has expired. And uh, I must uh, announce at this time that uh, Mr. Caston will be the last person to uh, ask questions. Mr. Caston, you are now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you all for being here. Um, as, a, as those on this committee know, I am 
I am here in Congress because I am deathly concerned about climate change. It affects every aspect of our lives, our health, our national security, our financial system, and the the effects of climate change, both physically and financially, are nonlinear, but our human brains think in linear patterns, which makes us prone to massive undershoot, which is what we've done over the last 30 years. In that context, I was very pleased to say that the Fed finally listed climate change among risks in its biannual financial stability report and was happy to hear that the Fed is going to join the network for greening the financial system, reversing its earlier position. I want to start with just a quick yes or no across the panel. Do you believe that climate change poses a significant financial risk? Yes or no? Vice Chair Quarles? Uh, I, I believe that it certainly uh, poses a risk that we need to understand. I should state that we did not reverse our position on joining the NGFS. We have always been uh, talking with them about joining. Well, participating, but we're not joining. Um, yes or no, Chair Hood, do you believe climate change poses a significant financial risk? I believe it's a risk that's worth understanding more so we can get better, better clarity and so we can really try to mitigate it. Chair McWilliams, yes or no? It's it's a risk we have asked our banks to take into account when underwriting loans and considering um, um, risk management in general. Acting Comptroller Brooks, yes or no, does it present a significant financial risk? <laughs> I, I would echo the comments of my colleagues. Okay, I'm I'm a little troubled that you seem to be hedge, you all seem to be hedging on the word significant. But moving on from there, Vice Chair Quarles, the the Fed has previously said to your point that they would. Um, that they would stay on the sidelines in the NGFS, but this week announced that you would request membership. Um, can you give any color on what prompted the change in approach, Vice Chair Quarles? There was no change in the approach. Uh, we have been talking with the NGFS uh, about uh, joining them for some time. Uh, they had indicated that that would not be possible until recently. Um, okay, well, I'm glad that you joined. Um, about an hour ago, I was pleased that Chairman Powell um, it said, and I quote, we do think that central banks and we here at the Fed have a contribution to make. The focus is on incorporating climate change risk into financial stability and bank regulation and quote, it follows from our assigned legal mandates that we do this work. Vice Chair Quarles, do you believe that we currently have enough insight into banks climate risks to appropriately assess the overall health of the bank and financial system as a whole? I think we can always uh, improve it, but we do have mechanisms to understand risk of the banks, including. Do you, do you believe that the Fed has the existing authority to stress test financial institutions for potentially systemic risks, including but not limited to climate change in the absence of a congressional mandate? Oh, yeah, but we, we certainly don't need a congressional mandate uh, uh, to do that. There's a great deal of work that would be needed to do that properly. Uh, the Bank of England is probably uh, has done most of the, has probably most advanced in thinking about that, and they're still very uh, preliminary in doing that. They play their uh, uh, their approach on stress testing for climate. Um, it, I, I don't know if there was a difference of opinion in the way that you all answered the question at the start, but um, the let me be very clear: there is a significant risk associated with climate change. There are hundreds of billions of dollars of loss at assets. If you were to agree with me that there is a significant risk to the financial system, do you believe you have the obligation to stress test the financial institutions for those potentially systemic risks? Uh, we, we will stress test uh, uh, all the risks, uh, you know, that are uh, modelable. We, we, we do do that. Well, I, I hope you appreciate my question. We have huge amounts of loss on coastal properties, huge amounts of loss from forest fires across the country. We are, we're going to be through the Greek alphabet pretty soon and into the Hebrew alphabet if we're not careful on, on, the, on the hurricanes that are hitting our shores this year. Um, I don't know actually if Hebrew alphabet follows the Greek alphabet. I just know that we're getting to the end of the first one. Um, but if what it takes is congressional direction to act, then then the bill that I've been leading with Senator Schatz, the Climate Change Financial Risk Act is necessary. But I would hope that, that you all are, are willing and able and have the obligation to do that beforehand because these risks are massive. And as I said at the start, our human brains don't do very well with nonlinear change. Albert Einstein's great line was that the most amazing thing ever invented was compound interest. Um, and we are in a very nonlinearly changing world. Thank you and I yield back my time. Uh, the gentleman's time has expired. 
On behalf of the chairwoman, I'd like to thank our distinguished witnesses for their testimony today. Without objection, all members will have five legislative days within which to submit additional written questions for the witnesses to the chair, which will be forwarded to the witnesses for their response. I ask our witnesses to please respond as promptly as you are able. Without objection, all members will have five legislative days within which to submit extraneous materials to the chair for inclusion in the record. This hearing is now adjourned.